All right, welcome uh, everybody. We have our good friend, Dr. Bo Branson, rejoining. And if you're hearing a little bit of echo, Dr. Branson, don't worry. I'm going to mute when you're talking and you won't hear me uh, echoing on your end. Can you hear me okay right now? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay, cool. All right, so uh, welcome back. For those that don't know, Dr. Bo Branson is a good friend of ours who teaches in um, Indiana. And uh, remind me of the name of the school. Sorry, it's Brescia, and it's, it's That's in right. Kentucky. I, yeah. That's right. Excuse me. I know. Close to Indiana. Sense. Um, and, uh, Dr. Branson's uh, specialty is analytic philosophy, uh, but he also does a lot of, uh, research into the Cappadocians. His thesis was on particularly Gregory of Nyssa and the question of the Trinity and the logical problem of the Trinity and the question of, uh, the, the monarchia of the father in Cappadocians and particularly in Gregory of Nyssa. So, um, you got a new uh, piece out that you've just sent me that will be in a future publication, and uh, that is four views on the Trinity. Correct. Uh, so I think the title is "One God, Three Persons, Four Views." Catch now, is that one God a reference to the? I'm just joking. Is that the? <laughs> the it's is, a reference specifically to to William Lane Craig's yeah. <laughs> uh, three headed dog God. <laughs> and uh the the four views does that count as a separate uh, entity there making it a five-headed right. figure right yeah, exactly. so there's the yeah, essence and the five views. we're trying to work up to the uh the nine person <laughs> godhead of Benny hen or whoever it was who said that each person of the trinity is its own trinity or whatever you're muted i think if you confused energies with persons, you could say that the seven spirits of God are all hypostases, and then you could have a seven. There you go. We could get yeah. Just try to just try to up the numbers. <laughs> um, now the four the four views. Um, so it'll have William Lane Craig, um, William Hasker, and Dale Tuggy, and myself. So, um, which will be is is interesting. And uh, you you will be presenting, I assume, the monarchical Trinitarian view there, correct? Yeah, um, yeah. So I the the title of my chapter is "God and His Word and His Spirit are One God," um, which is a quote from John of Damascus. Um, to to maybe I'll say a little bit about it, and just um, I, I think you maybe I heard you say that in my dissertation I talked about Gregory of Nyssa and the monarchy of the Father. Um, in my dissertation, I really only focused on um, what what are called the inseparable operations or synergy. So the the unity, um, sort of the response that Gregory Nyssa gives in to Ablabius, where he's talking ma mainly on my interpretation about the energies, um, the divine energies, and that that's kind of his answer in that uh, to the to the challenge to the to the Trinity in that work. Um, then later I did a bunch of podcasts or video things about the monarchy of the father that I really didn't talk about at all in the dissertation. So some people sort of know me because they looked at the dissertation and some people know me from the videos and <clears throat> they're sort of like two different things. And I think a lot of people either think that I don't, I reject one or I only believe in the other or, uh, or they don't see how they can fit together or what. So part of what I do in this, in my lead essay is I try to kind of show sort of a bigger picture uh, and it's all kind of consolidated just in the in the lead essay so I go through kind of different senses in which you would say there's one God and and um, uh, so sort of how it all fits together so hopefully right and for those that don't know um, we'll get into this here in a little bit with some depth but basically the responses to Dale Tuggy are, are in regard to his Unitarianism. So he is sort of the leading, I guess, academic Unitarian. And, and mm -hmm. that's the position that basically the one God is identical to just the father. And so there's no other distinctions in, in the Trinity or um, basically just a form of Arianism. Yeah. And so if you want to highlight uh, or elucidate any of that, if I've stated his position yeah, well, he, uh, yeah, his view is is even uh, lower Christology, I guess, than, than Arian is. So he, his view is just that Jesus is a, a human. They don't like it when you say purely or 
No, they, they, they don't like what you say merely human because they're like, well, he's not merely human. He's awesome. But but um, <laughs> but it's still like, let's say he's a really purely, cool guy. Yeah, he's he's not just a, just another dude. But um, but yeah, he just thinks Jesus is a is a human who created, you know, in four B.C. or whenever he's born and, um, you know, uh, anointed by God and yada, yada, but but a creature. Right. Um, and the, you, I guess his, I, I really don't, I don't quite get the view on the Holy Spirit, but the, they'll say something like the Holy Spirit is just the father in action or something like, it's just kind of talk. So they don't really, most Unitarians of his, like his ilk, I guess, kind of don't think of the Holy Spirit as really a separate person. They just think of him as like an energy or just metaphorical for God doing stuff or something. I'm probably not doing justice to the, to the idea, but anyway, that's, that's the idea. So there's really not a Trinity or, um, on his view. Yeah. I think so. you said in your lectures, they massage it. <laughs> they kind of put, put it to the side, the question of the spirit. Um, yeah, I don't, yeah, I, I still don't quite, quite get the view, but, um, yeah, that's, that's the, the, his, the view he's defending. I mean, so mainly in, in the in the book, I guess to just if you want me to mention kind of what other people do in the book, I can go into my paper in more detail. But he he just gives kind of like 20 facts about the New Testament um, that he thinks all sort of are uh, more expected on the hypothesis that they were Unitarians than on the hypothesis that they were Trinitarians. So it's mostly just sort of New Testament stuff, and he's kind of trying to make that case. And actually, William Lane Craig's lead essay, um, I'm, I mean, I'm kind of disappointed in it in, in a way, but it, 90 something percent of it is just him talking about the New Testament and the divinity of Christ, which on the one hand is, is nice because it's he's all up on that, you know, New Testament scholarship and so forth, and he consolidates a lot of scholarship and summarizes it and so it's that's nice um that he just kind of makes this big case for the divinity of christ and then kind of also the holy spirit and spends a little bit of time saying why the holy spirit's a separate distinct person or whatever and then he's got like i don't know a page and a half or something of like his model of the trinity so it's, so it's like for for me to respond to it, it uh for so so just to I guess I'll say like William Hasker's response to, to Craig is like two pages and he just is like, yeah, I pretty much agree with all that stuff. And uh, I, so for me to, I wanted to say something about his view of that training. So I kind of had to dig into, you know, other things that he's written. Um, so anyway, I mean, on the one hand, it's nice that he, he's kind of did that, but um, it was a little, little weak on the details about his actual view of how to, what is the Trinity? Why is this not tritheism, et cetera? And William Hasker, he has the, the book, um, uh, I forget what it's called, Metaphysics and the Tripersonal God. Yeah, um, I think, I think, I, is that, I think I have that one. Yeah. And he kind of, I mean, in, largely his lead essay is kind of summarizing what he argues in that book, but from a little bit different angle, but I see. Um, yeah. Well, I've got your, I see that you sent it to me. So I've got it pulled up here. Um, uh, I thought I had it. And so uh, I'm not blaming you. It wasn't, it was yeah, a no, misunderstanding. No. I, I, I don't know. I'm looking at it now and I see that you are, uh, you're, you, you kind of in the very opening salvo there answered some of the questions that I had when I called you about 30 minutes oh, really? ago. So, oh, okay. <clears throat> so I had a question about, you know, some of the phraseology that I remember from John Damascus, like, you know, God and his word and his spirit are in right. reality, one God. Uh, I remember reading that a couple of years ago. And so right. listening to the lectures, I was thinking, you know, it seems like I remember somebody, maybe John Damascus speaking that way. But before we get yeah. into that, one thing I'd like to point out is that you said, you know, in the in the lectures, you pointed out that one of the projects that you you really want to work towards or or to 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 do is to inform the debate that goes on in the philosophic and analytical sphere about the Trinity with history. You can't really divorce, you know, divorce Trinitarian yeah. theology from particular church history, but particularly the the Cappadocians and and their con contribution. So maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's I spend a whole chapter in my dissertation talking about that, and I, I have a my first actually publication 
was uh, basically a kind of reworking of that chapter in in the American Catholic Philosophical Quarterly, um, just a paper called A Historicity in Analytic Theology. Um, and so, yeah, I, my I guess my view on, on that is um, I'd make a distinction between what you might call philosophy of religion in a, in a general kind of sense versus what I would call philosophical theology. So philosophy of religion kind of asks these very general questions about, you know, is there a God? Is is religious belief rational and so forth? And those are questions that are um, a, a lot of it in reality is sort of tied to a more Western, like Judeo-Christian Islamic sort of paradigm or whatever. But but it's largely, you know, these pretty general questions that you could just ask, you know, with, without worrying too much about what religious tradition you're talking about. But questions in philosophical theology are really questions about like a particular theological view that's that's always going to be embedded in some kind of historical tradition, right? So um, I, I just try, try to argue that it, it really doesn't make much sense to try to ask these sorts of questions without worrying about the history of that tradition. Yeah. Um, and to kind of the summary that I give of it in this paper is just the, the basic thing that I argue is you, the, what you end up with in, in analytic philosophy, I think a lot of the times is just, um, a non sequitur argument where people will say something like, here's my model of the Trinity. Uh, my model is logically consistent. Therefore the doctrine of the Trinity is logically consistent. Or like my model of the Trinity does X, Y, and Z. Therefore, the doctrine of the Trinity does, mm -hmm. and it, it. I mean, that just has the logical form like A is F. Therefore, B is F. <laughs> it's like, well, that that's false. You have to establish that there's some connection between your model of the Trinity and the actual doctrine of the Trinity. Yes, right. And, and really, no one people might pay lip service to that, but like no one really tries to do that. Uh, or very, I shouldn't say no one, but very few. Um, I, I will say this about William Hasker. I I disagree with some of his interpretations of Gregory of Nyssa and so forth. But like, at least he, he tried to do that. Um, William Lane Craig just doesn't care. Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. To not to put a too fine a point on it. Yeah. Um, I mean, he just explicitly like rejects the Nicene Creed. Yeah. The Athanasian Creed. The councils right it's, well he, he's identified as a Polinarian for a long time yeah he's a Polinarian about christology so it's just like yeah i just i mean so it's just kind of like yeah i just who cares but and i mean my thing then is like well then how what what is the doctrine of the trinity like what do we mean by that and that's actually something that came up in his response to me um which i still have to we're all supposed to send in our final things by like november or i guess october 31st so uh, soon to be wrapped up but um but yeah my, my i mean he just talks about what's in the bible and and um basically my my response to that i don't know how the, the word count is getting uh kind of slim so i don't know how much i can respond to him but but my my basic response there is like if if i were to decide at some point that dale tuggy was right all along and like the new testament doesn't say anything about the divinity of Christ. Or if I if I decided what the Bible says about the Trinity doesn't really entail there's three divine persons or Jesus is divine or something like that, would I also describe would I describe that belief by saying I now believe that the doctrine of the Trinity doesn't entail that there are three divine persons? I wouldn't. <laughs> that sounds crazy, right? Um, so that seems to mean that I don't use the phrase, the doctrine of the Trinity to just mean whatever the Bible says about the Trinity or else if I decided the Bible doesn't really say there's three divine persons, I'd have to say the doctrine of the Trinity doesn't say there's three divine persons, but that just seems absurd to me. Like, yeah. of course it does. Uh, right. Uh, instead, I, I ought to describe that by saying, well, I've just decided that the, the Bible doesn't teach the doctrine of the Trinity. Yeah, I right. Three divine persons. I just say it doesn't teach the doctrine of the Trinity. I wouldn't say the doctrine of the Trinity says there's not three divine persons. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it, right. It just, 
yeah. crazy to identify the doctrine of the Trinity as what the Bible says about the Trinity rather than what the church fathers and councils have said yeah. that the Bible says about the Trinity. <laughs> it's, the, it's so I, anyway, to, to me, it's just it seems obvious that a phrase like the doctrine of the Trinity refers to kind of the official doctrine that the church. Yeah, like, exactly. Presented. Uh, and I and people always get weird about their life. Well, the church isn't infallible, you know. I'm a Protestant, and blah blah blah. And it's like, well, yeah. I mean, I don't have to presuppose that the church is infallible just to say that's what the phrase means. Exactly. Like if we were talking about the doctrine of transubstantiation or the doctrine of like papal supremacy or something, like I would say, well, the doctrine of transubstantiation is whatever the Council of Trent or whatever, right said it was like i don't think they're infallible i just think that's what that's what the phrase refers to yeah. so it would be like you know if i came up with a model of transubstantiation and was like yeah here's my model uh nothing happens when the priest says you know, says the word like like i'm this is my baptist model of transubstantiation it's right. like that's not the doctrine of transubstantiation it's not like you've got a little different model or interpretation. It's just, you're just, you've just abandoned the doctrine. Yeah, and I would people like William Lane Craig would just be honest, just say, yeah, I just reject the doctrine of the Trinity. Like that's, that's, I think the proper way to describe it is just, yeah, you reject the Nicene Creed, you reject the council, you reject, you have this view that's kind of in the ballpark of the Trinity. So that, it's nice, but it, but you just, you reject the doctrine of the Trinity. Yeah. I think a lot of that's bound up with, two different notions of, you know, first of all, presupposition about what the church is. Christianity yeah. and the church are just this thing that's kind of in process. We're all trying to figure it out, a sort of a quasi-humanist <clears throat> notion that's very popular in academia. So we're all part of the church, and we're all just trying to kind of figure out what its doctrines are. And so we have a system-building project, which is what a lot yeah. of philosophers and academics are into, which is I'm going to I'm going to invent the system that will, you know, pr solve the problems and I'll make a name in academia or whatever the motivations might be. Yes. But yeah, I think you nailed it there that, uh, you know, it really makes no sense to divorce, you know, yeah. the actual historic meaning of the phrases and the terms. Right. I mean, You're, I think it's, you hit on two things that I think are totally right there. <clears throat> One is I think there's this kind of like, job security for philosophers thing going on where like that is like yeah that's what philosophers want to do like yeah. we, we want to build a system and come up with some creative new solution like that's what's going to get a publication because you came up with this great idea and like to just say um like to do what i basically try to do is just be like yeah here's what these guys said centuries ago it's fine <laughs> Like that's not like that's not a super publishable, you know, paper. Uh, and and the other thing is, yeah, I think this Protestant mindset of like um, Chris, I, I always think of it as like archaeological, like, um, well, I guess you could think of it in two different ways. I mean, so, some Protestants come at, at Christianity from this, what I think of as archaeological point of view, like this, this religion just blew up and died out at some point <clears throat> when the evil like Pope Vader and. Uh, Emperor Constantine, you know, and just ruined everything. And let's try to reconstruct it. Um, but I think there's also, yeah, there's also the kind of attitude of, yeah, it's this system, but like it's this incomplete thing that we're still kind yeah. of like working on or whatever. Um, and then, yeah, that leads them to to want to try to conceptualize everything in some way so that there's room for their own kind of creative thinking and philosophizing about things. And I think when someone like me comes along and is just like, yeah, but now you're just changing the subject and this is not really the doctrine of the Trinity anymore. They just kind of react to that. They don't, yeah. they don't want to hear that. So. <laughs> so let's get back to this question of Unitarianism and um, Trinitarianism, because yeah. one of the things that you point out that, uh, you know, that Dale Tuggy doesn't really address is the, the model of a Trinitarian philosophy that the Orthodox Church has. He, he addresses the social view and the egalitarian view, and the actual historical doctrine is the monarchical Trinitarian view, which is that the Father yeah. is the sole arche, source, fount, principle, anarche, etc. Right. Um, and so you're kind of admitting, uh, you know, in the lectures that he kind of has a point just in mm -hmm. that yeah. these other models are not very good. 
but he's not actually addressing our model. Would you want to comment on that a little bit? I know this is old hat yeah. for you, but just for our audience. Yeah, for people who haven't gone through uh, six hours worth of <laughs> whatever. Um, <clears throat> yeah, basically over and over in, in Dale Tuggy's um, papers that he's published on the Trinity, like the, the big... The, the big central sort of issue that keeps coming up is that um, he just thinks like in the New Testament, God equals the father. Just same thing. There's two different words for the same same guy. Right. Um, and, and and what I point out in those podcasts of mine is I say, I mean, basically, he's right. Like if you if you do just read the New Testament and like all I mean, this isn't like in some ways not even really controversial, like any biblical scholar, New Testament scholar is going to say, yeah, that's right. In the New Testament, just you see God, it probably is referring to the father. I mean, there's times when it might refer to the son. Um, uh, and, and Tuggy addresses that. And he said, I mean, all of them are sort of controversial for obvious reasons. But um, his thing is sort of like, hey, as a Unitarian, he just says, like, even if I grant you that there's like a half a dozen or so references or a dozen references to christ as god as theos there's something like you know it's two or three hundred instances of the word god in the new testament and like anytime anytime the context like aside from those handful that refer to christ um anytime like the context makes it clear uh otherwise it's referring to the father so like when you know when paul says the you know the love of god the grace of Jesus Christ and the communion of the Holy Spirit, right? Well, it's obviously God means Father and then Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Um, and there's there's plenty of places like this where it's just clear from the context that they're using the word God and Father sort of interchangeably. So, um, but what he does is he argues that sort of by definition, Trinitarianism identifies the one God with the Trinity, um, and that you can't, like a Trinitarian, can't just yes. identify God with the Father. Um, hold on one second, because I have an I have an ornery cat who's about to ruin something. If you um, got a if you got a blender, you could stick him in there. A blend? I don't want to. I don't want to blend my cat into. I'm just, a, joking. I'm just joking. I'm just thinking about that will it blend guy on. <laughs> yeah right. Um. So let's see. So we're so um. Yeah, that, I mean, that's basically what I argue in those in those podcasts and in a paper that I published in Theologica, One God, the Father, um, is I just say, um, you know, that's not like a, that's not just like an uncontroversial definition that Trinitarianism, you know, by definition says God equals Trinity. Um, and by definition, if you say God equals the Father, then that's Unitarianism. That's you know that, that's a substantive kind of claim. Uh, because I mean, partly because I'm saying what what the doctrine of the Trinity is is not just whatever you stipulate because that's kind of what your grandma says about the Trinity, or like that's what's on the First Baptist Church's website about the Trinity. Like we have to go back and look and see like what do these yeah. guys actually say. And what I argue is that you know when you go back and look, actually. Um, all the Greek fathers kind of speak in the same way. Like they tend to use the word God to just refer to the father right. a lot. Um, and, and seldom um, uh, the, the use of the word God to, or, or like the one God to talk about the Trinity or describe the Trinity as the one God is something that kind of ha develops over time. And there's sort of a reason behind that and so forth. And anyway, I just point out like, look, there's there's the, the the key issue for Trinitarians is like, do you think there are three divine persons in there and they all have the divine nature and they're not there's no Aryan equivocation going on or anything. Um, and yet you still think that there's uh, there's only one God. Um, and you could, and I just say, look, you could you can have a view like that where you just say God refer the word God refers to the father, the one God in some sense of the term God, like that's the father, but the son and the Holy spirit have the same divine nature as the father. Um, there's no, I mean, you know, you, you can, you can yeah. still do that. And, 
Um, he and the, he, the the thing that's weird. I mean, the way the way that he defined Unitarian and Trinitarian in the past, um, really, I mean, literally made it so that you would count as a Unitarian even if you said there are three fully equally divine persons, um, yada yada. Like if you just say God is the Father, but the Son and the Spirit have the divine nature equally and fully, blah 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 you just count as a, as a Unitarian automatically. And I, I criticize that in this book, he's, he's changed his definitions. He's tweaked them a little bit so that he um, he's added in that to count as a Unitarian, um, you would have to reject the claim that the son and the Holy spirit are separate, distinct divine persons. So you can't, you can't believe in the divinity of Christ anymore on his view um, to be a Unitarian. So, that means I'm no longer a Unitarian, I guess. So, well, and and for this <laughs> <laughs> on his on his right definition. on his grounds. Yeah. Now, for the sake of the audience, for those that don't know, um, one of the reasons that we stress it in the Orthodox Church that the Father is the the one God, the the sole fount, Archie, and so forth. It's not just in disputes over the Filioque, but it also we would say is pretty consistently in scripture as Dr. Branson was noting yeah. about the new Testament references to, you know, to the one God, um, you know, Paul yeah, says I mean, the, Paul says, the yeah, father of lights, you know, all gifts come down from the father of lights, you know, yeah. the one God, uh, and father, our Lord Jesus Christ. The creed says we believe in yeah. one God, the father, right? Yeah. The, yeah. Paul says for us, there is one God, the Father, yeah. and one Lord, Jesus Christ. Uh, and yeah, even the creed says, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, right? Um, and uh, so, so yeah, what, what one thing that I do in the paper, though, so then sometimes people hear that and they think, oh, that means you reject the view that Jesus is really divine, or you, you can't call him God in any sense or something like that. And that's, that's not the idea at all. Um, so in this paper, what, one of the things that I do is I just kind of go through different senses in which you can use the word God. So it, one distinction is sometimes we use the word God as a subject or as a right. referring expression, right? So it's like, like you would say the, uh, well, like J or, you know, uh, the president of the United States or something like that. It's just, you're referring to some individual, right? Uh, sometimes we use the word God as a predicate, as like a descriptor, right? So this thing is divine or something. So like, you know, if you say that Baal, it was the God of the right whoever, the Philistines, whoever, whoever he was anyway, uh, or Canaanites, I guess. Um, anyway, I mean, that's just a, you know, it's a description. Like if you, or, or, you know, like when, um, what is it? When Elijah is, is uh, talking with the prophets of Baal, right? He says, if Your Baal God, is yeah. God, then such and such, or if, you know, if Yahweh is God, then, um, or there's a, there's an interesting um, verse where I think it's to Hezekiah. Uh, he's, someone says, um, thou art God and not man. And a lot, like in our Bibles, it'll be, they always capitalize God. It's capital G when it's like the true God or something like that. Uh, or not, it didn't say, sorry, did I say God and not man? Man and not God. Uh, but anyway, it, it looks like, because it's lowercase m, there are man and not God. It looks like you're a human and you're not this person, this individual. Right. But actually, it's it's parallel, right? It's actually you are human and not divine is the what's being said. Um, yeah. Even in Hebrew, right, like the word Adam, you know, sometimes refers to the individual, the first or Adam and Eve, or yeah. Sometimes the word Adam just is translated man because it just means a human. Yeah. Right? Um, and it's, it's just kind of the same with God. Like sometimes God refers to this, some individual, and sometimes it's just kind of divine. And then I point out there's different senses in which you can use it as a predicate. Like there's different things that it might mean as a description. So um, the first thing I talk about having to do with the monarchy is... Um, you know, it early on. Um, well, so let me put it this way: if if you if you search through like uh, there's a tool with a lot of classicists and people use the Thesaurus Linguae Graeca, which has all these texts from ancient Greek 
times all the way up to the fall of Constantinople, and it's all digitized, and you can search through it. And like if you if you search for the word polytheia, which is polytheism, you get like hundreds and hundreds of hits, uh, and going all the way back before Christ and all the way around. If you look for the word monotheia, mono, monotheism, um, there's like two results, and they're they're both from like it's like Gregory Palamas and maybe someone else around the, that time, like, it's, you know, in the 13, 13th century or whenever it was. So it's, uh, it's barely ever used. So you'd think like, well, what's the deal? I mean, people are talking about polytheism, but they don't have a word for monotheism. But the thing is, if you go and look at the places where people talk about monotheism and polytheism, they don't use the word monotheism. They use the word monarchia. So yeah. the, the contrasting terms are polytheism versus monarchia and um that goes back all the way to like to philo the jewish philosopher who was just right before around the time of christ um and early christians when they're worrying about what we would call monotheism they're worrying about the monarchia so like right. if you read Tertullian, um again you know who's writing against these uh modalists in the in the like praxis against praxis yeah like he talks about, you know, people using the word monarchy. He actually kind of makes fun of people because they're, I guess, trying to, like, affect a Greek accent when they <laughs> you know, say it and stuff. And um, so anyway, the point is, like, when, the, when, when they're thinking about is there one God, what they mean is, is there one ultimate source of existence right. for everything, right? And so in that sense... Uh, yeah, it's it is just the father, right? The father is the monarchy, the the one source, right? So in that sense, it's perfectly correct to say there is one God, the Father, right? He's the one God because he's the one source, even of the Son and the Spirit, and that not not in the sense that he created them, not in the sense that they, you know, come into being in time or something, but in some timeless sense, he is the source or the root or the foundation or the, um, the, the fathers use all these terms like the, you know, fountain, the, the spring of a fountain. Yes. So, so I just, uh, in my responses to Tuggy, I just say, yeah, that's, that's perfectly orthodox to say, right. That there's one God, the father in that sense. And that's the sense in which the creed say, you know, is saying there's one God, the father, and even St. Basil, like when people, uh, accused him of being a, Diatheist or tritheist, he he responds by saying, uh, "There's one God because there's one Father," and that's what. And, he's, and he even goes on and says, "Whoever preaches two first principles, yeah, preaches two gods." But he says, "For us, we just have one first principle, so we're monotheists, right? We have one God." Um, there's other senses of the word God, too, where uh, the first thing I talk about is the divine energies, that there's a sense of the word God where it has to do with a certain kind of power or a certain kind yeah. of activity that God engages in. Um, Gregory of Nyssa thinks that that's something like beholding because he there's reasons why he thinks that. But anyway, it's not really important so much what the specific activity is, it's just that if it predicates an, an activity... Um, then that's kind of a different sense of the term God. And then there's another sense in which it might predicate the divine nature, um, which actually uh, an interesting thing that I found out in doing my research for my dissertation was um, all of these pre-Nicene church fathers, whenever they talk about what the word God means, um, they all deny that, that, that the word God used as a predicate, like predicates the divine nature of something. They yeah. all say it's not the nature it's an activity. It's a right. certain kind of activity. It's the Arians who come up with this and start pushing this idea that it predicates the divine nature. Right. Because they wanted to use that as an argument against Trinitarians. Yes. So you've got three hypotheses that have the same nature, then that's three gods, because the word God means thing that means has the thing that nature. has nature, yeah. Yeah. That that comes up in the the Galwitz book, I think, when he goes into the Eunomian, the way Eunomia is predicated. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we basically says that to call God father is to call him basically ingenerate. And so father yeah. just is ingenerate. Therefore, divine nature just is ingenerate. And so therefore, distinctions must entail, you know, being a creature. Yeah. And for Eunomius, it's even it's kind of crazier because he I mean, he just has this 
well, I don't, I shouldn't say wackadoodle on on uh, publicly, but anyway, uh, he has a he has a kind of anyway he has an extreme view about divine simplicity. Yeah. Right? So for him, everything just ends up being right. the divine essence right. because God is so absolutely simple. Whatever you predicate of him is just the divine essence. Um, and the th so that's and that's his argument against the Cappadocian view is yeah. like, well, we all agree that the Father is unbegotten um which is kind of their term for ase um and uh everything's identical to everything when it comes to god so that has to be the divine nature yeah it's just being ase right and so if you admit the father's ase and the son is not absolutely totally in every possible sense ase there's some sense in which he's from the father he's begotten from the father eternally then he doesn't have the same nature because there's no yeah. no distinction. and this relates to a lot of the people in in our field because we've had to you know deal with a lot of muslim argumentation and you know me yeah. and premise is very close to a lot of the, the muslim argumentation one thing i would like to point out about this notion of the father as source another reason this matters is that you eventually get a different order of theology order of theology in the west which i really like the way that you went into the um, the fourth Council of Constantinople that the Roman Catholics accept, and they, th that's one of the first creedal yeah. uses of that phrase, the one God in three persons. That's that's an Augustinian shift that oh, we actually yeah. see. Yeah. And I, I just wanted to read one quote really quick, which is, people forget this, not you, but people forget that yeah. in the triads, St. Gregory of Palamas makes a really yeah. good point in the third triad, section 12, where he says that when God spoke to Moses, he did not say, I am essence. He said, I am the one or he who is. So I am he is the argument here, meaning that the reason that it's really important to begin our Trinitarian theology with the person of the Father is that, uh, as uh, I think Meyendorf effectively argues this as, as well as Lasky does, this makes the starting point of reality and of the Trinity uh, hypostatic, personal. Right. Uh, it, it's not beginning with the common essence, which then tends to lead over into this modalistic type of view. Um, so could you comment on that as to why it, why that it's so important yeah. to guard this soul source as the person of the father, not just the common essence as the, the unit, the, the principle of unity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think that's really right. And there's, um, you know, there's this whole, um, once upon a time, people made a bigger distinction between like Greek and Latin views and, and, um, in more recent scholarship, people have said, well, that's kind of an exaggeration. There's really more, you know, they're, they're kind of closer, but I do, I do think that at a, at a sort of deeper level, there really is this, there really is a, a difference. Um, so like any, any Roman Catholic theologian who actually knows their theology um, is going to say, yeah, we believe in the monarchy of the father. Right. Like they're, they're going to I mean, they're going to say that like they um, and it is I mean, it's official, you know, day feeding. Yeah, the dogma. Vatican clarification yeah. admits all of this, too, but it, it does admit at a certain point in the document. But these two views are still in tension. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, there, any any Catholic is going to say like that. Yeah. The son is eternally begotten of the father and the Holy Spirit, like eternally proceeds from the father. They're going to say in the son. But point being, they're going to say, yeah, the father is like the ultimate source and yada yada um but the the thing about it is like if you if you look at kind of like aquinas for example like his overall sort of system it's like it's it's true that the father is unbegotten and doesn't proceed and it's true that the son is begotten and the spirit proceeds and they're from the father but like at a deeper sort of level, um, the way he thinks about things really does start with the divine nature and this like utter simplicity of the divine nature. And then he's he, because of that, he, he ends up with this issue where like, well, if the divine nature is so simple, like how do you get to hypostases? Like how do you how do you even get a trinity? And it's it's only it's only when you have these asymmetric relations that can't 
like even even a relation that you know if it's a if it's the sort of relation that like you could bear to yourself like the liking relation like i could like myself or not like you know if, if there's something like that that you could bear to yourself then that's you don't get a trinity out of that like that's not good enough right it's only if there's these relations like being a father where you can't possibly be a father to yourself like so that sort of prize the divine nature into two hypostases of the one nature or something and yeah. so then because he's thinking that way like he's kind of starting with the divine nature and thinking of it as so simple that then he needs the filioque because you've got to have you've got to, so you've got you know begetting and spirating that sort of pry apart the father from the son and spirit but you've got to have something to kind of yank apart the son and the spirit so you've got to have a relation in there too and that that all comes from so even though you get this result okay yeah the father you know begets the son and spirits the spirit and it's the same but but the way of thinking about it is really that your your the, the most fundamental thing in some sense really is the divine nature and then it's just you pry these hypostases apart you know with with these relations um, so that's a very different way, really, of thinking about the Trinity than to start with the Father, and you say, okay, we the, the most fundamental thing that we start with isn't the divine nature; it's we start with the idea of yeah. the person of the Father, and every hypostasis has to have a, a nature, has to be a kind of some kind of thing, and has a hypostatic property, right? Some quality that makes that thing an individual thing right so it, we start with father and we've got yeah. automatically a divine nature and the father's hypostatic property of fatherhood and because he's a father because that's his hypostatic property then you get a son, a son yep. off of that right so it's not like you start with the divine nature and then try to yank apart yeah we don't things. have to invent relations of opposition and this kind of weird stuff which would relate to a dyad. There's no opposition in a triad. Dyad is is an as a, a relation. Yeah, opposition yeah. is for is for a dyad, and then also this. Uh, you have the ability with hypostatic properties to pick out what's particular to the person, and then keeping that balance by whatever else you predicate of God or the triad in this case is common to all three. And that way you don't start getting powers or um, properties that two have that one lacks. And that's where I think it starts to get into yeah. to trouble. Because even if you were to posit, say, this, the Beckos argument or what some of the Roman Catholics argue that, well, but what if the son could be like a secondary cause underneath the primordial cause of the father? Um, the problem is that it's not, it's still granting uh, a, a subordination in the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit doesn't have even the secondary causal power. He doesn't have that median yeah. power. So there's still a lack there. And I think as you've effectively argued in your lecture, you know, go, going from St. Photius, if you're starting to, to give powers to two, you might as well give it to all three. It would make more sense to have cause yeah. as something that all three share rather than two. Yeah, I've actually... Um... I've been talking a lot with my friend Scott Williams, so I'll, I'll give a shout out to him uh, lately. But so he's he does um, a lot of like Western and medieval scholastic philosophy and theology. He did did his dissertation on Henry of Ghent, um, and a lot of it has to do with the Trinity. Um, anyway, so he's yeah he's helped me kind of understand the Western view about the filioque better. Um, still not sure that it's coherent or not but well, one thing i would but, say uh, yeah. yeah go ahead but, but i do think i mean i do kind of understand it a little bit uh, anyway a little bit better um and i and i he's he i think um I, some of the some of the arguments from orthodox sources like saint photius for example um I mean, if you think about it he's writing very early on before the really, debate, yeah. classics really kind of dig in all this stuff. So there's a lot of his arguments that, that maybe don't apply to some of the later scholastics because they're, you know, they're sort of formulating their view in response to, to him. But, um, but I do still ultimately think, um, I, I guess, I guess at this point I would say, I, I think like, 
have to do more thinking about it. Like maybe there's some, uh, maybe there's a way to make it coherent sort of, but um, I'm pretty sure it's not going to actually be the Cappadocians view. Like if you do come up with a metaphysics that kind of makes it all. Make so sense. even if you had theoretically a median cause argument, um, first of all, it wouldn't be what's actually in Florence, right? Cause Florence says, yeah, that's, that's, that's yeah, that, that's the big thing is I, I yeah, but with Florence, I just, I feel like Florence like just took, it's just the weirdest, I, I just feel like it's such a weird <laughs> council because it's, it's just like any, anything that Orthodox might have been able to say like, well, that could maybe be okay. They're just like, we explicitly mean <laughs> precisely the worst possible interpretation. Yeah, it explicitly like, says you know, eternal hypostatic origin from... Yeah. The father and the son as from a single principle and yeah, that's the yeah. that's the problem so even if there was some sort of uh becos uh, argumentation about a uh, uh, media yeah, cause yeah, that's not cool. that's right. I, I don't i don't believe that i think that the or, i think the orthodox response to that with the notion of um you know existing with and and ex necessarily existing with doesn't ne necessitate that you're the cause, right? So I can relate to something in different ways without the relations being identical, right? So I might share a, a common nature with other human beings and I share yeah. a common nature with my father, but my father relates to me in a unique way as my only source. But because I share uh, the nature of, you know, my brother, we, we have that same nature. We exist with that same nature. That doesn't make my brother my ca the cause of my nature. So likewise, even if the, the son exists <clears throat> at the same time as or, or co you know, co-eternal with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit has its existence and is repose in the son, none of those phrases equate to uh, the spirit taking on or because he proceeds through the son, it doesn't follow that. The son is therefore the cause of his hypostatic existence, precisely because it seems like the stress in the Cappadocians on the father as the sole source and cause. And if he's the sole source and cause, then if there's a perfect son generated, then by necessity, the, the procession of the spirit must also be perfect from the father. In other words, it can't be, you know, yeah. this is a Fodian argument. It can't be imperfect in the sense that, well, the father does this part of it and then the son does this other part of it. Yeah. Right. It has to be whole and entire. If it's whole and entire for the sun, then it, it follows that it's whole and entire and perfect for the spirit. Do you, do you think yeah. that argument still holds? Well, yeah. So, I mean, I think, um, yeah, like Photius's argument is kind of, uh, ironically, like this uh, would be a problem for divine simplicity, right? If the father causes like part of the spirit and the son causes a different part, like, well, then he's not simple anymore. Um, what, I, what I figured, I mean, I, I didn't get this before, but what Scott Williams kind of helped me realizes that the the way i guess that they're thinking about this double procession thing is sort of like what what we would talk about with the inseparable operations odd extra um so like the way the father son and holy spirit all sort of jointly cause cause the creation and they count as one creator a single creator right. because and that's another sort of part of the paper and and my dissertation is like if they have a single energy then they that's one creator they just all three sort of count as a one the one creator and that basically they're applying that same sort of thinking to the procession of the holy spirit right from the father and son but they're collapsing the the movement of the spirit in terms of energetic manifestation they're collapsing that into hypostatic origin and palamas yeah, yeah. palamas makes a really yeah. strong case that you know, you have to have three different le le plane. He calls them three planes, if I remember correctly. He says there's the plane of hypostatic origin, which is very strict in that, you know, the father is the sole source, uh, right. son begotten, spirit proceeding. And then the next plane of existence is the procession of the spirit and the energies. The spirit proceeds uh, from the father through the son, and thus the energies take the same, they have the same movement from the father through right. the son and the spirit. And I think the Cappadocians, you say, returns to the Father, which I've never yeah, understood yeah. exactly what that means. But I think it's, I was going to ask you if you could elucidate that. But um, before I ask you about that, um, 
you know, that, that and then the, the third plane that Palamas talks about is the economia. So th- those have to all three be distinguished in his line of argumentation. Um, what do you what, do you think that's still kind of the correct model for this inter- this what we would say in regard to like Lyons and Florence? Yeah, I think that last thing you mentioned is uh, is a good point too. That um, a lot a lot of times in the West, like Catholics and Protestants both will do this. They'll they'll think like yeah, economic activity of the Trinity is all kind of like a reflection of something going on in the imminent Trinity. Uh, meaning, in other words, meaning, um, you know, if, if the, yeah, if the son sends the Holy Spirit, uh, he breathes the spirit into people or something like into the disciples, then that means that, you know, in eternity, there's this thing going on where, uh, there's this relation between the sun right. and the spirit. So it's like everything that happens in time and creation in the economy, like reflects something that's, that's true about God, just sort of in eternity abstracted yeah. away from creation. And I have no idea of why they think that, <laughs> but it's just kind of like a premise and, and, and a, never seems like it's very well argued. I mean, sometimes people will say something like, well, otherwise we wouldn't have any way, you know, to know anything about the Trinity. And it seems like, well, revelation, like, uh, right. Like, like if Jesus says the Holy spirit proceeds from the father. Like that seems like a way you could have knowledge that the Holy spirit proceeds from the father. Like, so I, it, I always find that really unconvincing, but it's something that's that they, they often assume. And so I think it is important to, point out that that's there's a distinction between what happens in time versus what happens in eternity well but he also stresses the distinction between what happens at the level of hypostatic origin right. versus yeah, yeah. energetic manifestation versus, and the movement right. of the energies um right so what do you think about that um i think it's a pretty good interpretation of the <laughs> of the of the fathers because well, what really the the way I would describe it, like with as far as Gregory of Nyssa, who I'm yeah, because I was going to ask you about Greg, because you know they're yeah. basically at, even at Florence, they're basically arguing. Well, what Sorry were the Cappadocians saying? Yeah, here's my my view on the on Gregory of Nyssa, like from a just kind of scholarly perspective. There, here's here's kind of the tension, right? Um, when Gregory of Nyssa talks about the hypostatic properties explicitly. Um, he says they are simple and unshareable. So he says that the usia, the divine nature or essence, is shared. All the persons have the divine nature equally. The hypostatic properties are simple and and unshareable. So, and that's important, right? So on, on the one hand, it's uh, they're unshareable, right? So if the father has fatherhood. The son doesn't, the Holy Spirit doesn't. If the spirit proceeds, then the father and the son don't proceed. Um, but also he, I mean, he says they're simple. So you can't say, so you, if, if you said they weren't simple, they're the, the, the idiomata are just unshareable. You, someone might make the argument, well, the father's hypostatic property is a conjunction of, you know, begetting but being unbegotten and spirating and not being spirated right and all of that together is what distinguishes him and then the son you know is begotten but he spirates the spirit too and is not spirit and then the spirit is spirated but doesn't beget and is you know so you might say oh well that's fine they can kind of share some things but it's like the whole the whole big package is unshareable but that's not what Gregory Nyssa says. He says they're simple and unshareable. So in his, yeah. his explicit statement, it's not like you can chop up the father's idioma into parts and yeah. like share a part of it. Yeah. Just as long as you don't share all of it, it's just it's simple and unshareable. So it's just and then elsewhere, he says when it you know when it comes to the usia, they've got the whole usia in common. But he says when we're talking about the the idiomata, the hypostatic properties. He says they have the persons of the Trinity have nothing in common with respect to the idiomata, nothing in common. 
right? So that would, yeah, so, it'd be that's, that's pretty strong language for yeah. you know for anybody would try to deny the father as the sole cause and say, well, but there's also yeah, this other yeah. kind of co-cause. So that so that's one sort of piece to the the puzzle is that when if you're looking at his ex- explicit statements about his metaphysics, it looks like there's just no way to reconcile that with the filio. Anyway, not any straightforward, obvious way to reconcile it with the filioque. The thing that makes it puzzling and weird is that then he also will say things, um, he'll give metaphors and analogies and things that that do look sort of like the filioque or, or like some kind of Beckos style thing or whatever. So um, like he'll give the analogy, he gives the analogy of um, like you've got a torch that's just always been burning or whatever. And then you've got a second torch that's lit off the first and then a third torch that's lit off the second. Yeah. So that looks like, well, that then that looks like, okay, the father begets the son. And then it's really the spirit proceeds from the son really immediately. But, you know, you could sort of look at it as ultimately from the father or something like that. And that, so then that looks like, well, then it's kind of, you know, uh, is that a, what is that from the father through the son or what's going on with that? Um, and so that's what makes it kind of difficult, I think, to to interpret him is because it's he's got explicit statements that just look like that's not it's not going to work with the filioque. And then he's got analogies that are kind of like, yeah, well, how does that fit? So I think really the, the interpretation about energetic processions like that's a pretty good way to solve that <laughs> that because otherwise well, you're just kind of left looking at it like what is this how does this work well this is important because and i'd like to get your comment on this not just with nissa but the other Cappadocians as well is that a lot of times when roman catholics approach the issue they're really just kind of going through uh contra eunomius looking for a few quote minds or a few things that would support the position yeah. via analogies but the problem is that when you read the totality of the works uh, you realize, for example, in St. Gregor Nyssa's against Eunomius, he's also pointing out that the son cannot be a work of the father because he shares the same energies as the father. So in other words, the essence energy distinction is here. And the essence energy distinction is fundamental, yeah. again, not just to uh, Nyssa's contra Eunomius, but also to Basil's uh, contra Eunomius, as well yeah. as Basil's on the Holy Spirit. The operations of the energies are constantly used as a kind of argument Basil says, for example, if the Holy Spirit has all the same uh, energies as the Father and the Son, then he must therefore share the same nature because energy is the uh, manifestation or proceeds from the nature that has that energy. So, um, in other words, essence energy distinction is so fundamental to Cappadocians, all three of them, that it's really, it, 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 it's not only a question of, are there a few quotes in Nyssa that might sound like filioque? It's that the theology as a whole is bound up with not just yeah. not just hypostatic properties and father as soul fount, but also essence energy distinction. Mm-hmm. No, I totally agree. You know, it's it's one of these things where um, I, I really do I really do feel like that there there are Roman Catholics that interpret they want to interpret Basil and and Nyssa as like not making the essence energy distinction. Um, and I just think like, that's, just, I mean, like they feel like maybe they have to, to make it work with their theology or whatever, but I just think it's, it's very clear. Like it's yeah. just, it, it seems very clear. Like, and the, the reason, if you put it into the context of the argument, um, again, just th- think about this. Eunomius's argument is, like premise one, absolute divine simplicity. Like right. everything we predicate about God is just a predication of God's essence. There's no energies. There's no access. There's no. It, it just all has to be different ways of getting at the divine nature, which is frankly, at least as I understand Aquinas, like sounds a lot. <laughs> yeah, when it comes to the attributes, yeah. So yeah. Aquinas yeah. says. There is a a real distinction in in the strongest possible terms in his theology between the persons. There's not a real distinction between the attributes compared amongst themselves. Yeah, right. And he also says there's not a real distinction between nature and person. So that would fall yeah, into. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's the big <laughs> that's problem. I hang up the phone and go. Yeah, I, I I've never. I mean, I'm I'm. 
I don't like, you know, I don't want to accuse uh, someone like Thomas Aquinas of just being an idiot and crazy or something, but I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's a way to make sense of that. Well, to me, it seems like there is competing things going on. Like there's the, there's this Aquinas that is saying correct things, you know, mm-hmm. over here, but then there's another Aquinas that's kind of like, but we've also got to make August Augustinian ideas work. I've also yeah. got to, you know, make these uh, principles of, you know, uh, actually it's, it's Neoplatonic ideas of simplicity. I've got to somehow make that work with, yeah. you yeah. know, this, these other things that, and so that's, here. that's yeah. my take on it is that there's basically different Aquinas. Yeah. Well, that's, that may be, um, um, oh, I was going to, I was saying, so with Eunomius's argument, right, it's kind of absolute divine simplicity is premise one. Premise two, we all acknowledge that the father's unbegotten conclusion, um, unbegottenness is the divine nature. Yeah. Bam. So, um, and the, the, um, yeah, you know, I mean, like, like Aquinas and others, I mean, maybe they have, maybe they have good responses or whatever, but, but the response that you get from the Cappadocians from Basil is Basil just ridicules the, the idea that um, everything we predicate about God. Yeah, is, he just says he, that that's false from the outset, right? Yeah, like, I mean, that's what was it, Epistle 234 or whatever that. that well, he, and, and, and he argues that distinctions don't entail composition or division. They actually argue that if they yeah, did, then yeah. you, you know. Uh, you, you couldn't predicate anything. Of, I mean, they actually make a lot of the Palamite arguments before Palamas. That's why Palamas refers back oh, yeah, to yeah. a lot of Cappadocian argumentation. And, and Basil even, I mean, is pretty explicit. He, he says, you know, there's a difference between the essence and the energies. And he right. says, you know, you can't say that uh, God's mercy and justice and his foreknowledge and his act of creation and all these things, he says, you know, are all these just all names for the same thing? Like, that's crazy. And they're all really just the divine nature. Um, and he says, no, they're all distinct from the divine nature. They're distinct from each other. There's So his response to the Eunomian argument is to give the essence energy distinction. Right. Um, and I, and, I don't know if you've ever seen that. Have you seen Aquinas' response to John Damascus on the on the essence energy distinction? The one where he just says he's wrong. <laughs> well, it, it, he <laughs> says, he cites Maimonides. Yeah, he says, he says, uh, we can't pause the distinction between uh, operation and an essence because number one that would uh, mean that God has uh, accidents and then he says and M- Maimonides has said and he said so it's basically I'll just pull out Maimonides to re- so in other words he's citing Maimonides to reject <laughs> John Damascus so I like to pull that one out but uh, yeah yeah I'll have to look that up um, I'll show yeah I've got it over here on my shelf I'll send you the the screenshot oh I was later. I was going to mention because this is this is important um with uh, about the um the filioque stuff too is um when gregory nazianzen is responding to eunomius so eunomius um uh asks this question is um uh is begetting so the the cappadocians always do this where they say look um natures are individuated by the causal powers that they bestow on their bearers right or the activities that that are associated the energies what we call energies so uh yeah if two things have all the same energies then that's they're the same nature right so if the father's so the cappadocians are always like look here's this kind of challenge like give show us something in the scriptures that's attributed to the father like the father does but the son doesn't or the spirit does but the father does you know something that one does but the other ones don't and the, the Eunomians did respond and they said, yeah, begetting, right? Like the father begets the son. That's, and so what they were assuming is that what they, what they say is, look, um, either that's either begetting, either that's God's nature, in which case the father and the son just automatically don't have yeah. the same nature because the son doesn't beget. Um, or, you know, it's an energy that the father has, the son doesn't, right? Or, you know, which either way you're kind of, you know, uh, wrong either way and uh gregory nazianzen's response is that he says it's neither um he says that begetting is neither um the divine nature nor an energy um he says it's just a relation that's just mm-hmm. the really well and another point but here that the, the, whole, the, whole, the whole argument for the filioque 
assumes that we should take begetting and spirating to be energies, to be operations right. of the divine. Like that's how you get the joint, like like spirating as one principle is you have this argument that, well, the power to spirate is in the divine nature because yeah. that's one of the energies of the divine nature, right? And so the father and the son both get that power. And so they both spirate the spirit in just the same way, like just the same way that the, all three persons have the power of creating and foreknowing. Right. And so, forth. so it's equated as a as they an all, energy or a power. And by the way, yeah, if I recall, it's, the, it's, the Florence it's, quote is from On the Trinity, right, of Augustine. So that Florence is actually citing one of the f sections in On the Trinity where Augustine is making this argument. So we know in what sense it's meant. It, it meant it's meant in the same sense as what Augustine said. Um, mm -hmm. And Augustine collapses, like you said, action into essence in, in just this way. Yeah, it's always always been puzzled by that because, um, yeah, like the Cappadocian's response to Eunomius is just to reject the kind of extreme view of divine simplicity that Eunomius has. And Augustine, yeah, Augustine goes along with Eunomius in all all sorts of ways and i i've never i don't know if he just kind of didn't just because he didn't have access well i read a, I read a really good paper by a greek uh, theologian who argued that eunomius's arguments are, are really closely borrowed from plotinus so given the fact that i think even some of on the trinity kind of even just borrows directly out of the aeneids from yeah 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 that might yeah it might be that it might just be that he was convinced that that was that was right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess I get what uh, Augustine wants to do is to kind of take on board as, as much as he kind of, as he can from Neoplatonism. And so he's going to agree with Eunomius about a lot of stuff and try to sort of still make it work. But I, yeah, but so this is, I mean, that, that kind of goes back to this point that I, I feel like um, even if you could, if you can make, the filioque makes sense in some way. Like, I just think you're, you're almost certainly going to be doing it by not having the Cappadocians view. Well, and let's keep in mind, as you've argued, that the Cappadocian view is really what is codified at Constantinople one, correct? Yeah. I mean, right. So if you think about it, um, yeah, I mean, Augustine wasn't at the second ecumenical council. He was, I guess he was going, he, well, he was on his way. He was on his way. Yeah when he died, but, um, yeah. And, and when, um, so yeah, I mean, Augustine was like never at an ecumenical council to talk about his views. Everyone, I think pretty much any scholar will acknowledge that yeah. like Gregory of Nyssa is really kind of the, the mastermind behind the second ecumenical council really ultimately because Basil had already died just a few years before Gregory Nazianzen was the president for a while and then he quit and <laughs> And I think, and there's, I mean, there's evidence to show that Nazianzen yeah, was kind of disappointed with it. Um, you know, um, he, I mean, specifically that just that, you know, the creed still doesn't say explicitly that the Holy Spirit is divine. It just, they kind of left that a little nebulous, which I think he, he, he that was a big thing for him. And he, I think, always kind of like, ah we could do better than that. But anyway, Gregory Nis was there the whole time and was it it's there's a lot of evidence to show that like his theology was very very much influential at that um Well, that. is it accurate to say all three of the Cappadocians had a, a lot of influence and Nissa was really sort of the key there? Yeah, yeah, cuz I mean what really I mean Basil while he was alive was really kind of the the main character in a sense and in, in all that and after he passed away it was sort of like the the mantle fell to gregory of nissa in a way and and gregory sort of felt like i think he just kind of wanted to defend his brother's theology and and kind of clean up you know finish things that he hadn't finished and so on and so forth um but anyway there's there's a lot like after after the council was over um the edict that emperor theodosius issues like right after the council like gregory of nyssa by name is is like roman law basically at that point said for you to count as a catholic church 
you have to be in communion with Gregory of Nyssa. Like that's, that's one of the things that, so they, what they did is they listed people like actual individual bishops in each location in different regions where like, if there's a question about whether this person's theology is sound or not, this person is who you'll go to. They'll, and that actually happened. Like Gregory of Nyssa was called on to interview someone, you know, about their, their Trinitarian beliefs. Oh, wow. Their, Interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's really strong because uh, a lot of Roman Catholics bring that up and they say, where are you getting this idea that Constantinople I is, you know, this Cappadocian council? And and yeah. my understanding was that it wasn't even controversial in terms of the scholarship. I don't think, yeah. Now, um, let's see, you mentioned... A By the way, I mean, it's, 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 yeah. you mentioned this to you, that like, as far as, it, let, like, let's talk about Western Fathers a little bit because... Like St. Jerome, oh. Before you go to the Western Fathers, one question, because I do want to ask you about Jerome. Uh, you did make a good uh, point about this, before we move on from the Florence issue, you had mentioned the yeah. scholar that you were under, the the Jesuit, Father Daly, and you mentioned that, you know, his admission yeah, about yeah. Flo his admission about Florence, I think, was very telling. Yeah, so I, um, when I was in graduate school, uh, everybody told me, I, when they found out I was Orthodox, like, oh, do you know Father Daly? You should go talk to Father Daly. Um, and I did. I went out and went and talked to him. I sat in on a lot of his uh, patristics classes, um, a wonderful human being. Um, and he, you know, very eminent um, patristic scholar. He was nice enough to be the co-director of my dissertation. Um, um, and yeah, so he, he also was a big... Um, uh, person in the, I forget now what it, it's the, or anyway, the Orthodox Catholic ecumenical dialogue. Something. I forget what the, the exact name of the organization is, but anyway, the organization where Orthodox and Catholic kind of come together and talk about, you know, communion and so forth. Um, and that was another one of his big specialties was actually like Orthodox theology and stuff. Um, actually he was, uh, Callisto Ware was his, uh, his dissertation advisor. So, um, at Oxford. So he, he knows something about orthodoxy. Is. Um, but anyway, yeah, one time we were having lunch and talking about that and got on the topic of the filioque way and talking about Gregory of Nyssa and like, what well, was this from the father through the son or how is this, what's going on? And, uh, anyway, it came, it came up the thing about the double procession at Florence. And, um, he told me his, his view was that, um, for the, the Orthodox and Catholic church to come into communion and everything. He said, we, I think we just have to drop Florence. And I was like, how do you do that? I mean, that's an ecumenical yeah. council. Right? And he just said, he, he, he said his view was that uh, the Catholic church just needs to say that every council they've had since the great schism only counts as a local council and doesn't count as an ecumenical council. And then that way they could, they could say that the, the way they defined the filioque specifically as double procession, like in Florence, they could say, well, that was just a local council, so it's not infallible. Uh, it's just kind of our thing, and it's not really, you know, necessary for, for everyone or whatever. Which, I, yeah, I was kind of I was kind of shocked when he said that. I was just kind of like... <laughs> well, I mean, that would kind of undo the last thousand... That <laughs> no, wouldn't that undo the last thousand years. I mean, basically, Vatican I would be false as well because, yeah, you know... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's the thing too. It'd be, I mean, it's like yeah, papal infallibility then would would go out the. Right. I mean, not that you, not that you couldn't sort of bring it back or something, but I mean, you, you, the Vatican I would be not an ecumenical council. So then, yeah, it would bring into question like papal infallibility, and I just thought, I mean, I was really, I was pretty surprised when I when I heard him say that. But I mean, I think he's probably right that that's. I mean. Yeah, I mean, the, the real issue is is the dogmatic statement, you know, in Florence about double eternal hypocrite. I mean, that's the key point here. But yeah. now, uh, you were you, before we go to Jerome, well, I, I thought of one other thing, which is that another issue that comes up in Aquinas is his statement, uh, persona at relatio, person is relation. And Orthodox theologians have yeah. critiqued that for a long time as well, because a relation is a predicate and a person is a subject. So you, you can't say that a relation is the agent or the subject. They might yeah. be markers or idiomata, but they're not. They're also not strictly identical. 
And so that's, right. again, another one of those collapsing issues that we see, I think, in Western uh, simplicity yeah. models. Yeah, I, I feel like that's another one of these areas where I, I, I hesitate to, I, I don't like to, um, I don't like to think that someone like Aquinas is just like an idiot. I got, I got this. Um, well, I'm not saying he's an idiot. I'm saying that's a, that's a Lossky critique because he studied under yeah. Jill Sohn. So Lossky would be critiquing presumably Etienne Jill Sohn in that regard. His, yeah, his interpret. But I, I, anyway, so I, I try to, I, I like to want to try to come up with a charitable interpretation of, of someone. Um, so a lot of times I just look at some of these things and I think I have no idea what this guy means. Cause I, I mean, yeah, take, I mean, in a straightforward way, it's like, well, obviously persons are not relations. That doesn't even make any sense. Um, um, and even like in terms of kind of scholastic thought, like a suppositum, uh, as they would call it, like is not a relatio. Like that's just, that doesn't really, it doesn't really make much sense. But I, I mean, one way maybe to interpret it is like, I mean, like Gregory of Nyssa, for example, is a bundle theorist. So he, he kind of thinks of individuals as just collections of properties, um, which is a total, you know, just, I, I went over this just the other day in my metaphysics class, um, it's totally, you know, reasonable view. Like some people think that there's such thing as matter um, that, comes in and individuates things and some people don't maybe maybe it's just like bundle theory but there's not much of a bundle it's just <laughs> the relation or something it still seems kind of weird to um say that a person just is the relation but well but i mean maybe, maybe but, but remember, like but remember person is also not really distinct from nature so the distinction between nature and person that if I recall, Aquinas says that Aquinas says yeah. that's conceptual. He says the distinction yeah, between know. between the divine person, like between father and son, is a real distinction. Yeah, but yeah, between the father and the divine nature is purely conceptual, not real. So, yeah. so we see the so then the problems are arising again with simplicity. And it's like, well, but yeah, well, then yeah. then how would you distinguish the persons? Well, I'm going to introduce relations, relations of oppositions, relation of origin, yeah. a lot of different attempts at trying to distinguish. Yeah. I do. I mean, I don't know. So that's, that's the sort of thing. Like, I feel like I'd have to sit down and really study Aquinas and see like, what's, can I come up with some way to make it certainly on a straightforward reading, it does seem pretty hard to, <laughs> hard to reconcile at all. Um, and I guess one thing I would say is it's, you know, there, there's also that, you know, that what Aquinas himself actually meant is one question. And then like, how do Pete Thomists today interpret him and what kind of, you know, how, what does it sound like and how do people make sense of today is kind of another, cause there's a lot, there are, I mean, there are, there are Thomists out there who are just like, yeah, the father, son, and Holy spirit are all identical to the divine essence, but not to each other. Yeah. That's kind of a contradiction moving along and i'm like yeah. that's just you know and it's like ah i mean i hope that that's not really aquinas's view because that's just dumb like that and i don't i don't know i so anyway i hesitate to attribute those those things to aquinas without really digging through him but it's but it's like i mean anyway that interpretation of aquinas or that kind of version of thomism just seems like that's not viable like that doesn't make any sense. So, um, we, I mean, it's another, this is, it kind of relates to the, you know, again, like the issue of the filioque, like, I mean, Maximus, the confessor was okay with the filioque interpreted in a certain way, you know? Um, but then you get like at Florence, just let's interpret it specifically in the, the way that won't well, I, yeah, it won't, and it, and, it, you know. and it's even earlier because it's at twelve seventy four that they first used the Augustinian phrase of the double yeah. eternal hypocite procession. So, right, right, right. so I think yeah, we can grant a lot of uh, flexibility at least until Florence because that's really the first dogmatic yeah. statement of the double eternal hypocite. I mean, Lyons, Lyons is the first, and then you get the Palamite response councils and Gregory of Cyprus and all that, Black Rene and all that, right. and then you get Florence, but. Um, for those that are curious, the, the 
Crisis in Byzantium book by Papadakis, I think is really good on that. If, you, if yeah. you're in the audience and you want to read more on that in terms of the issue of the filioque, but maybe let's move on then to um, what were you, you wanted to say about St. Jerome and these, oh, these topics. Briefly about the, about the Western fathers. I mean, sometimes people paint this as like an East versus West thing, but like, um, like St. Jerome was at the second ecumenical council and Gregory of Nyssa was like, while the council was going on, he was working on a draft of Contra Eunomius and was like reading drafts of what he was writing to St. Jerome and St. Gregory Nazianzen. And like St. Jerome was all on board with what Gregory Nyssa was saying. And even, you know, in Jerome has a, what, whatever it's called, Lives of Illustrious Men or whatever the title is and talks about Gregory of Nyssa and approvingly. And I mean, he, Jerome didn't write a whole lot about the Trinity directly, but anyway, I mean, it seems like he approved of the Cappadocian theology and he was, I mean, he was at the council. Um, St. Ambrose, I mean, you know, Saint, famously, St. Jerome, like, criticized St. Ambrose because he's just basically said he just plagiarized everything from St. Basil, like, uh, which is kind of true. Like what, I mean, when St. Ambrose was made a bishop, like he just kind of gave himself a crash course in theology. Like, and a lot of it was just Basil. Like, um, and if you read Ambrose, like his theology is just basically St. Basil's theology. Yeah, that's, that's a great um, point. Yeah. Um, a lot um, of people miss it, that. It really is Augustine. And I mean, I, I don't, I, 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 I used to be more extreme on this. Like I kind of over time, I, I always, I've kind of grown more to think like, you know, there's less difference between Augustine and other church fathers and there's less difference between East and West. So, but, but I still do just think like there, there's, there's a handful of really key issues where like Augustine is just different from Ambrose and everybody that, that went before him. Um, like, you know, he, the thing with divine simplicity and like the essence energy distinction. And th by the way, this is, um, Ambrose says this at one point, he says that the, the name, so just like Gregory of Nyssa says, he says the word God, Ambrose says, um, is not a name for the nature, uh, but it's a name for the operations, which is yeah. the Latin term for energies. Oh, that's, okay. that's so the great, same yeah. thing. Gregory Peter Lombard, um, who's the it, for the audience, like in the mid, kind of later. Well, I guess not super late medieval time, but anyway, la later on in the Scholastic period, Lombard puts together the sentences, which is just kind of a collection, it's sort of a medieval quote mine, I guess, from the from the fathers yeah. about all these different topics, right? Um, he quotes Ambrose. So Lombard quotes Ambrose as saying the name, the word God is a name for the divine nature. So he leave, he just leave, leaves out the word not. <laughs> oh, wow. And, well, I, I, and that's I, relevant because, and as I'm sure you know, the, the fourth yeah. Lateran uh, council, yeah, um, yeah. it accepts the Lombardian definition of what mm -hmm. divine unity is. And that mm -hmm. is a further, uh, strong much stronger statement than the 869 the one god is the three persons statement yeah because the one god is, is the three persons or the three persons of the one god that's something that you can totally make sense out of um that's part of what i do in this in this book chapter god and his word and his spirit are one god sometimes people look at that and they think well that's kind of crazy and contradictory or paradoxical like, what does that mean or or they get fixated, like if people have listened to my podcast about the monarchia, then they think, oh, you can only use the word God for the Father, and you can't ever say that the Son is God, or the Trinity is God, or something. But um, what I do is I just say, I mean, there, there is this sense in which the persons of the Trinity are one God in the sense of the energies, right? So in, in the same way, we'd say they're one creator, because there's one act of creation that they all perform. There's They're one savior, because there's just one act of salvation that they all kind of perform and whatever the activity is that the word god expresses they all do that as one and so they're they're one god so you certainly can say this persons of the trinity are one god in a in the predicative sense that using the word god as a predicate right yes 
And so then it makes total sense for John of Damascus to say God, meaning the Father, and his Son and his Spirit are one God, because it's God in the sense of the Father or the sense of the source, right? And his Son and his Spirit are jointly one agent, right? They jointly do this, this activity. So it's kind of using the word God in the sense of the monarchia and then using the word God in the sense of the, the energy. Common energy, yeah. Yeah, John Damascus says there's one God because there's one energy because there's one God acting. But right. by that he means not to deny the, the triadic reality, but the way that the any action of God happens is triadic. So the one mm -hmm. action is uniquely manifested by the Father, Son, and Spirit in their respective roles. So right. um, it's still one God acting and one energy. But that also, by the way, for people who will clip this and obsess over it, it does not mean that there's only one divine energy. There are many divine energies, uh, yeah, yeah. as the Pino thesis has just gone into great detail to show. So um, let's see. Uh, I notice in your paper here, so sort of skimming, mm -hmm. looking at it, that you you did go into um, the... the uh, the recent you know, scholarship from Siegel and other people about yeah. how do we deal with the theophanies? Do you well, want to comment yeah. on that? Yeah, um, I do. And all, all of my interlocutors are shocked, shocked that I would, that I would talk about the theophanies and say it's important. It's totally unimportant. There's nothing to see here. Um, yeah, what I what I do is I, I say there's three, I just give three desiderata that you want a model of the Trinity or doctrine of the Trinity to, to do. I say you want, you know, want it to not be tritheistic, which is the big objection. And you want to address this thing from Dale Tuggy about why God equals the Father and how does that fit together, which we've kind of talked about. And what I say is that um, a lot of the scholarship just focuses on defending the doctrine of the Trinity against objections, and it makes it look like um, like there's no real motivation for the doctrine of the Trinity. It's just like, here it is. It's part of our tradition, and we just want to defend it against the, and And it kind of starts to feel like, oh, well, then if you can't defend it against these objections, like Unitarianism would just be the default, right? Yeah, uh, and, I, and I say that's not really true because there's there are reasons that motivated it, right? And the other thing I say is that um, my, my my issue with a lot of kind of modern these like models of the Trinity that people come up with is I say a lot of times they're so divorced from the original motivations behind the doctrine of the Trinity uh, that they just kind of are unrecognizable because they've they've kind of forgotten what the reasons were for the doctrine. And they come up with these models that don't really fit. So I talk about the theophany problem, which is just um, very simply, you know, God says no one can see me and live. Um, but then tons of people see God and live in the Old Testament. So how do you make sense out of that? And it, it turns out that that was that was a big issue um, in in late Second Temple Jewish uh, thought and, and in like Jewish apocalyptic literature. Um, yeah, I had uh, I had to read some of that for the uh, debate with uh, Daniel Hakikachu. So I went into yeah, a lot yeah. of those texts. Yeah, and it's it's really fascinating too. I mean, there's a lot of um, you can see it even when people aren't like explicitly addressing it. Um, there are all these texts like the Apocalypse of Abraham and these sorts of things where like it doesn't explicitly bring it up, but it's but it's clear that this text is like giving you a picture of God that's designed to make sense out of that issue, right? So like the Apocalypse of Abraham, for example you never see God, like you hear his voice a few times. But then there's this angel named Yahoel that's kind of like a, you know, combination of Yahweh and Elohim, Yahoel. And, uh, and that angel is who actually appears to Abraham and speaks with him and so forth. And so it's like, oh, okay, well, then that's what's really happening is Abraham never did actually see God. He saw this angel that kind of has God's name or something. And you kind of find out later that the angels a, a big deal. It's not totally clear if he's like created or not, but anyway, but there's all these kind of texts like this um, all through the Targums, which are these like Aramaic mm -hmm. um, supposed to be like translations of the Hebrew Bible from Hebrew into Aramaic. But a lot of times 
the translation will kind of veer into commentary, like it'll kind of go into explaining things and so forth. And in the Targums, you have this same look. Almost every time there's something anthropomorphic, anytime God is seen, anytime God changes or does anything, or there's any kind of anthropomorphism at all, it's like instead of God, it's the Mimra, which is just Aramaic for the word, like the logos, right? Um, so anyway, that's a, it's a big issue in late Second Temple Judaism. Um, and I, um, there's other, and it's what motivate, one of the things that motivates this, what, what people call the two powers theology. So this two powers in heaven that gets talked about later in the Talmud and stuff. Um, and what I point out is just, um, and a lot of scholars, I mean, this isn't like original to me. A lot of scholars have said, yeah, it looks like what's, what's happened was with Christianity. Christianity was just another one of these two powers views. There were a lot of different schools of thought in Judaism at the time. Right. A lot of people today, we think about Judaism as a more monolithic sort of thing because it's basically like kind of just the Pharisees that survived right. the destruction of Jerusalem and everything. But I mean, if you think about it, like even in the New Testament, we, we get, you know, we get told like the Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection. Yeah, exactly. They didn't believe in angels. They thought like if you there's no afterlife at right. all. So if you I mean, they literally said, like, if you can sin and you don't get punished for it or whatever, you are a gainer. That's what they, <laughs> you're a, like. If you die, you never. Great. Because there's no afterlife and they didn't accept any of the prophets, like just the Torah. So like if they, that's a very radically different kind of Judaism. Right. And then the Essenes were even kind yeah, of right. different still. So there's a lot going on in Second Temple Judaism, and um, a lot of people today would just say, yeah, it looks like Christianity was one of these two powers kind of versions of Judaism. Yeah, I think Boyarin says that Christianity, yeah, early Christianity represents a conservative form of, yeah. of that early yeah. Judaism. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's another thing is a lot of people have, have argued that, that maybe that is actually the more traditional, older view and the like strictly Unitarian sort of yeah, he's, he thinks that's, or uh, Summer thinks that's uh, Maimonidean. Oh, wow. Um, well, that, that, the strict codified view that, I mean, not that there, there weren't uni, Unitarian views prior to Maimonides, but that that it becomes normative as a strict Unitarian thing is oh, codified by Maimonides. Yeah. That's a Summer argument. Okay, fair, yeah, fair enough. Because um, it's all over the Talmud, these, these kind of, discussion yeah no i know they rejected there was a they had a re, they rejected uh was it rabbi saying. rabbi akiva speculated yeah. uh, one of them speculated yeah. about multiple powers and then they he gets rejected early on yeah it's funny you just reminded that's one of the things that motivated me to well it anyway, kind of was behind me converting to orthodoxy later but anyway that's that's a whole other whole other issue but um but yeah so there's a lot of scholarship to say okay christianity two powers in heaven version of Judaism and early Christians just kind of identified Jesus as the second power. Right. The Messiah is the second power. Um, and so that's where you, and there's where you get the doctrine of the Trinity, right? It's because they thought Jesus is the Messiah and he's the second power in heaven. And, and then, and then you get questions, you know, so later you get questions, and actually, Steve, Father Stephen DeYoung points this out in the, the Religion of the Apostles that, you know, you have um, versions of, of Judaism where the second power is a created angel like Michael or, you know, and then you get versions like where Metatron like, or something. Yeah, Metatron, who's explicitly a creature. And then you get versions where it's a human like Enoch or something yeah, that's like yeah. been kind of elevated to this divine status. And then you have stuff like the Mimra and the Targums, which looks like, okay, that's probably uncreated. Um, so he just points out that that sort of gets reflected later in Christianity with like Arianism would be kind of like the yeah. Metatron or Michael sort of view, like Christ is a created angel. The adoptionism is like the Enoch view, like Jesus is a man who's kind of elevated. Right. As, and then Orthodoxy is sort of like the Mimra view that's like, you know, it's, He's uncreated. Um, and I think that's probably right that you just, you know, you, you have, I mean, Christianity just came out of Judaism and, and um, it makes sense that people would 
be looking at these Jewish schools of thought and kind of thinking, okay, where do we fit? And, right. and whatever. And um, um, anyway, so my my thing is like that's that's the historical origin of the doctrine of the Trinity traces back to two powers Jewish theology and this question about the theophanies. And so your model of the Trinity ought to have an answer to this question. How is it that you can, no one can see God, but everybody sees God. Exactly. Right. Does that work? Um, So I go through kind of how the, uh, I I mean, basically I just say the church father's view is not, I mean, they, they're all pretty clear. Like the person that was seen in the theophanies was Jesus Christ. Right. Um, All the second century apologists say that third century, the Cappadocians do, and it kind of goes, goes on up. Um, Well, and it seems to be the way Jesus argues to the Pharisees in John five. And it doesn't seem like the Pharisees really take issue with it. You know, he says no one sees the father at any time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No one has ever seen the father at any time. And that's, um, well, one thing I do, um, is I, I point out like, okay, so Unitarians, I mean, of course have a, what I call a father theophany theology, right? So the, the theophanies, the appearances of God in the Old Testament have to be the father for them because there's not, there's no one else that could, right? Jesus wasn't created yet and the Holy Spirit's just another word for the father. So they have to have a father theophany view. Um, well, th- is that is that because they, hold on, is that because they have to, well, I mean, they ha- do, they, do they have to t- grapple with the fact that it's identified as God and worshiped or why, why wouldn't they just say it's an angel, a created angel? Well, I was going to say, you're, you're right. They, they could just say it's a created angel. Yeah. Um, but, but my issue with that, um, and I talk about that in, in my response to, to Tuggy, my kind of challenges to him is I say, um, so like, yeah, you could say it's a created angel. Um, well, let me put it this way. You could um, sometimes some Unitarians will respond to this whole thing by saying, yeah, cool, whatever. But that's not Jesus. Jesus is just created. Um, but it's like, well, if you have two divine persons, it's just not Jesus. I mean, that's still <laughs> you're still <laughs> right. Like if that's, yeah. if that's tritheism or ditheism for for Trinitarians, I mean, it's still ditheism. It's just not with Jesus. I and mean, that's not who cares. Right. So. Really, you, you mean you'd have to say it's a created angel. So you, you, in other words, you're just going really with old school Arianism, right? right? That the the logos is this creature or whatever. Um, and I don't really have time in in the within the word count that I that I have to go into like a full criticism of Arianism. But I but there's kind of two things I'd say about that. Number one, um, Arianism. I mean, I hate. I, People don't like to hear this, but I mean, from a scholarly sort of perspective, like Arianism is not not like a nut job view. Like it's not just like totally. I mean, there's a reason why it cropped up in Alexandria in the fourth century and like took so long to to work out is like, I mean, it's there's there are arguments for it. There's a lot of ambiguity in some of the second century and third century writings and so forth. So it's like, I mean, it's not it's not so nutty, Um, but it's also it's way I mean, it's 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 way far from where like Dale Tuggy is, where Jesus is just a creature, because for the Arians, like and think about this. I mean, Arians were clear that like. when Yahweh shows up to Moses and says, I am that I am like, that's Jesus. Right. Um, I mean, they would call him Yahweh. I mean, Eunomius even says like that he, you know, he says nothing I've said goes against the divinity of Christ. And it's like, what? But, but, um, but I mean, they had a pretty, I mean, they, they actually had a pretty high Christology. It's just people today will kind of caricature them as like, Oh, they thought Jesus was just a man or he's a creature, whatever. And it's like, well, I mean, really, they had a kind of, you know, like as high as you can go Christology without being quite, you know, orthodox. And and people kind of forget that, that it's, you know, it's not just like a low Christology view. It's actually pretty, pretty high, but just kind of not quite there. But anyway, the other thing that I, that I, I just kind of briefly say is um, it's pretty difficult to look at the, the character that... Uh, speaks to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and 
visits uh, Abraham under the oak of Mamre and says to Moses, I am that I am, um, gives the Torah to Moses on Mount Sinai, makes the covenant with Israel. Um, <laughs> and it looked like that guy is a creature. That, I mean, that's just hard. It's, I mean, okay, but it's hard. It's hard. Intuitively, that seems pretty hard to believe, right? Uh, for me, like to, to go through, actually read through the Bible and look at all of the theophanies and and be like yeah that's that's a creature um and and in fact i mean i think that that's kind of the reason why a lot of um a lot of people just assume that the person that's showing up in the old testament to talk and reveal things and make the covenant and so forth must be the father must be god the father because i think they just intuitively they know like that that dude can't be a creature that's that's the, that person is divine mm -hmm. i mean that just it just it just is weird it's just is so maybe i mean that's not a super fantastic argument there's i think there's other arguments you can make against arianism i think it just kind of gets too too much in the weeds and i didn't really have a lot of time for it but that's kind of the, the argument that i make to tuggy is just like that's a that's a thing you have to swallow if you if you want to go down that road you have to say like this person is a creature. I think that's, I think that's pretty tough to buy. All right. So you uh, move in this paper to discussing, uh, you know, Calvin and later theologians. Um, is that, let me, I'm looking here. Is that because. Well, maybe I should say one other thing about the, on sure. the theophanies that I, that I do argue okay. is that, um, so I talk about, you know, father theophany, theology and son theophanies theology and um i just point out like so the the logical form of those statements right like no one has seen god or you know isaiah saw god moses saw god you have a subject or a quantifier it, this is the kind of the logical form of the statement quantifier or subject term relation seeing and then god right the object of this relation so you've really got three ways to resolve that apparent contradiction you could you could uh what we call restricting the quantifier you could restrict the quantifier and say well, when it says you know no one can see god it really means something like no sinful person has ever seen god or no you know certain kind of person or something kind of like when we say there's nothing in the fridge and we really you know of course there's oxygen yeah, we really right. mean like no tasty food in the fridge is what we really mean. You know, there's nothing on TV, nothing good on TV. So you could do something like that to try to resolve it, right? Restrict the quantifier. Or you could say like, well, there's different senses of seeing. You could kind of equivocate or just kind of talk about, well, you can see, you can't see God in certain sense, but you can see God in a different sense or certain times or not. So you make some distinction there. Or you can make a distinction in the term God and say, well, sometimes the word God refers to one person and sometimes it's referring to a different person, right? And essentially the two powers kind of theology, that's what that's doing is saying, well, there's, there's, and, and some of them even put it this way. They, they actually put it in turn, they talk about the, the invisible Yahweh and the visible Yahweh. And some of them will actually, actually say the, uh, they basically call them big Yahweh and little Yahweh. It's kind of like Yahweh Hagadol is sort of like Yahweh Senior and Yahweh Junior, um, which you then you look at the New Testament, it's like father and son. Hmm, it's kind of like Yahweh Senior, Yahweh Junior, right? Um, so here's the thing I say, look, if you have a theophany, if you have a view of the theophanies that say the theophanies are God the Father, then you can't use that solution, right? You can't say it's, well, it's referring to two different people because it's the father who's the one that shows up. Right people see so you have to use one of the other two or the other or both right you have to restrict the quantifier or make distinctions about how you can see god right um on the other hand if you do have if you have a sun theophany or you just have a two powers kind of view then you can use that solution and you could use the other two but you don't need to right so what i do is i go through the book of mormon and i and i point because mormonism explicitly teaches that the theophanies were god the father and so right. I go through the Book of Mormon, and there's all these passages where um, the like Joseph Smith translation of the Old Testament, um, ev everywhere, all over, all 
over and over and over it he he puts in no sinful person has, can see god no one without the grace of the mormon priesthood can see god right so all these times where it's restricting the quantifier right or it'll say things like you can't see god with your physical eyes but with your spiritual eyes or you you can't see me like you did at one point in time. Yeah. Now at this point in time you can't. So it's distinctions in the way or sense of seeing or the circumstances or whatever. <clears throat> so that it's always, I mean, in every case, and it talks about a lot. I mean, there's numerous verses in the in the Book of Mormon that, um, and the Joseph Smith version of the Bible that talk about this, and it always uses those two strategies to kind of resolve the issue. Never, never talks about a different divine person or anything like that. If you go through all the passages in the New Testament where it it brings it up, the New Testament like doubles down on the language like no one has seen God, no one has seen God at any time. Yeah, right. no one can possibly see God. He dwells in unapproachable light. No one has ever seen him, nor can see him. Jesus says, no one's ever seen the Father. You've never seen him at any time, or nor heard his voice at any time. Like it's just over and over and over doubling down on there's no restriction on the quantifier. There's not different senses, there's not different times or possibilities or way. And actually there is that there is a, a, an exception made and it makes an exception for Jesus. So there's a few passages where it says no one has seen the father except he who's from he, the father, yeah, right. Jesus, right? So it's like, well, the only exception made, for who can see God is Jesus. Um, so anyway, the point being, the New Testament never does those two two things that you have to do if you have a father theophany theology. But it frequently mentions a second person, which is Jesus. So it will say, no one has ever seen God. The only begotten has revealed him. Um, or Philip says, show us the father. And Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. You've seen the father, yeah. Right? Um, and there's numerous passages where it does it, too. It, may, it will mention, you know, it'll say no one can see God, and then it says Christ is the icon of God, or Christ is the exact image of his hypothesis. So it it has all these, you know, you know, statements to the effect that Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Um, so anyway, that's kind of my argument that it just looks like the New Testament clearly has this view that it's Jesus who was the theophany figure. Yes. Exactly. Um, and yeah, all my interlocutors think that that's crazy, but none of them have any good response to it. So. Hasker just he says, says he's agnostic that. about it. And William Lane Craig's talking about swamp man or something. Human. He, he says God couldn't could have just materialized <laughs> humanoid figures. To, and I'm just like, okay, whatever. <laughs> well, you can't uh, worship swamp men. I mean, I'm pretty sure. Right. Yeah. I mean, I mean it's, at least, at least Augustine has like angels. Like at least make. Yeah, I mean, an angel would be a better. Yeah, <laughs> than, yeah the, rather, the, uh, but the uh, toxic avenger or something. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, All right. Well, do so. Go ahead. Do, do you want to move up? This, do you want to get more into yeah, where the no, argument we, progresses? Yeah, we can move on from there. Okay. So I just kind of say, yeah. I mean, I just argue that you know the the Cappadocian sort of view, you know, it it. Uh, gives you a way to, to to say why in the new testament the word god just refers to the father typically which is that he's the monarchia the one source and that's how they're how they're using the, the term um uh and you so you get one god in that sense um there's one god in another sense where um you know you can use the word to apply to saints and demons yeah. whatever because of the divine energies um, right. or in the demon's case, not so divine energies. But anyway, the energies um, because of inseparable operations. Um, and then you can use, if you want to use the word God to predicate the divine nature, you can, uh, you get one God in that sense too. And I talk a little bit about kind of ancient views about counting and the idea of quantity and, and why they sort of ends up that you have one God in that sense too. Um, so I just kind of say in, in any of those senses, you still get the result that there's one God. So it doesn't end up being tritheistic. We've got an answer to Tuggy's issues about the New Testament. And you have this response to the Theophanies problem. Um, and it makes sense out of 
things like Basil saying there's one God because there's one Father, or like the Nicene Creed saying that, and if, you know, uh, John of Damascus saying God and His Word and His Spirit are one God. Right. Uh, and I just kind of point out, I well, I'll have to. We're having to cut stuff down, so I'm going to end up taking this out of the conclusion here. But what I kind of go into with my responses to the other authors is just sort of the further away they get from this orthodox and historical sort of view, the the more those kind of break down and they, they get they get worse and worse sort of views. So like Hasker believes in the divine processions, like eternal begetting and eternal spiration. Um, but he doesn't believe in the inseparable operations. Um, and so I just say, well, then it, that causes a problem. Um, one of the things I bring up is this whole three gods issue. Um, people focus on that and they don't think about the fact that there are other predicates that generate the same problem, like savior. Right. The father is described as the savior. The son is described as savior. But then Isaiah says there's only one savior. No one else is a savior. You know, um, So there's other things that we want to say there's only one of. Um, and Gregory of Nyssa's response in terms of inseparable operations kind of resolves all of those all all at once right because saving is a divine activity it's a divine energy yeah there's body. there's roles that each of them have in that mm -hmm. one act right yeah and it's one so it's one unified one act unified so act yeah counts as one one savior one creator one redeemer sanctifier whatever you know there's lots of and i point out that you know this is uh, it's a problem for all of them. I mean, even the Unitarian, even Dale Tuggy, right, has to say, like, there's, I guess, two saviors because they're not the same savior. I, don't, I, haven't, have, I haven't seen his response to that yet, but we'll we'll see if he has a good response to it. But I just say, I mean, all of them reject inseparable operations. Um, and so they all kind of have to deal with the same issue as the tritheism yeah. issue, just with different predicates. Different predicates, right. right. Um, and then with... with um, William Lane Craig rejects the monarchy of the father and the eternal begetting and procession. Um, so I say, I mean, he's got a problem with the, the monarchia. Um, there's not really one. Well, it's not, it's just not super clear to me. Maybe he'll clarify in his final response, but it's not clear to me what his view is about what's, he kind of says this thing like the Trinity. He thinks the Trinity as a whole is this kind of like Voltron captain planet thing you know that's like that's the one god um and he says that's ase um but then also all the persons are ase um but there's not four ase things there's just and i have no idea really exactly how that works so but but anyway i mean he's got there certainly is a question here like is there one first principle like one thing that is the ultimate being um, I mean, I guess the most charitable way to read him is to say that he thinks that that's the Trinity, but then it's, but then he gets this question. It, there's this question of like, so why is it that in the new Testament, typically the word God refers to the father? Yeah. And uh, at least in the stuff that we've written so far, I don't really see a good, well, and, and I mean, he's acknowledged that. That's true, but well, as you, the point that you made too, that, you know, pretty much throughout the new Testament and throughout the patristic corpus you have consistent uh usage of subordination and so the, mm. we, we, we don't need to be afraid of subordination that a lot of people's reaction to subordination is to swing over into this egalitarian trinitarian view as yeah. if as if that will somehow stave off all of the subordination points but subordination isn't the problem because the church fathers teach subordination but what does it mean to be subordinate? And you can be subordinate in different ways without sacrificing, yeah. you know, the deity of the, the son and the spirit. Yeah, I, I edited a guest edited a, a issue of Theologica, um, which is open access. So you can read all the articles if people want to look at it. But um, Mark Edwards wrote a good paper for us in that issue about just that. I mean, he just said, like, what he, he described as like the Gorgon's head of subordination is like in theology, people are just like subordinationism, ah, you know? Um, and he just goes through and he says like, look, there's like 
I think he gives like five or six different senses of subordinationism. You know, yeah, you exactly. Talk about, and he goes through, and he's just like, look, very clearly, um, the, you know, here's one or two senses that are just absolutely affirmed by everybody in the theological tradition, like all the way, you know, up into the to the Protestant Reformation or something. There's some that are always denied, and some maybe is a little bit more questionable. But and that's what he says is just like, yeah, you don't, you know, you don't have to. Um, you don't have to get a distinction in the divine nature or something like that because you have a hypostatic, you know, a causal sort of subordination or something like that. Um, yeah, I, I have a view about this. I I think that um, I think that the rise of nominalism in the you know in into the scholastic period, beginning the modern period, um, and in Protestant theology and stuff. Um, wreaked havoc on uh, a lot of the these issues I, I think what i think that what what it is is that i i really don't i really don't see any way to make sense out of the trinity if you're a nominalist um uh in a in a strong i mean if you just kind of think there's just individuals and words and that's all there's no sense in which there are properties or right you know essences and things like that I think that, yeah, you probably can't really make sense out of the doctrine of the Trinity on those presuppositions. And you probably do just get the result that this is three gods and it's all contradictory and it's whatever. And I think what that did is sort of drove people in two different directions, which is you get a lot of kind of rationalists who are like, well, let's just give up on Christianity altogether right. or be Unitarians or some kind of whatever. And then you, I think you get another strand where it's like, people want to hold on to the doctrine of the Trinity and the whole tradition, but they can't make sense out of it anymore. And I think you get a lot of like reinterpreting exactly what the whole debate was really, really about. And so I think that's when you start getting people talking about like subordination is like the, the real issue was that, you know, the Arians wanted to subordinate the son and make him not equal. And we're enlightenment people who believe in democracy or whatever yeah, you know right. what I mean? and you know and and that's what the fathers want to do they want to make them all equal or something and it's like the stuff about you know homo usius is just kind of like it's just a way of kind of getting at that issue and it, i just think like no the homo usius was about being homo usius that's why they use the term it wasn't it wasn't like secretly about this deeper whatever about subordination but i think that's what how it's happened is is you just you got a lot of reinterpreting of what the Trinity is about because they just couldn't make sense out of it on their philosophical presuppositions. Do you and see so a now, do you see a specific time where you, I mean I, I'm aware of like late medieval nominalism and all that, but I mean like do you think that are there certain is that it, would you say that well when Calvin talks about you know the persons being off say uh, would you relate it to that or. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Actually, I don't know. I mean, I don't know much about Calvin, so um because he's a nominalist, right? But he talks about Well, that. I mean, it's hard to say because sometimes there's arguments that in places he's influenced by realism, but then at other times it seems like he might be influenced by nominalism. Um, but you know, specifically his denial of the eternal generation because well some people even argue that he didn't explicitly, but he does say the sun is off say. So I'm just wondering if that, yeah, if that I, move is in that I've direction. I've read a little bit about just his theology and that. And I, um, I think that, um, I think Calvin's probably misinterpreted on that score. I don't think he, I mean, it sounds dumb. Like, I don't know if, if someone, you know, out there is like a big Calvin person, they'll probably be like, this guy's an idiot. But, um, I, I sort of think he doesn't really think that the sun is Asse. <laughs> Even, I mean, though that, I mean, I know, and I know that's exactly what he says, but I, I think like when you look at, because what he says is, yeah, the sun is totally Asse because the father grants him Asseity and like makes him Asse. <laughs> and you, you read that, you think like, that's what this is. But I think what's going on, he, you know, Calvin makes this distinction between different senses in which you can say that something is Asse. Um, so there's a hypostatic sense and there's an essential sense. Um, and so what, you know, in other words, what the way Calvin thinks about it, I, 
as I understand it anyway. And I, I mean, I could be totally wrong. I'm not a Calvin scholar by any means, but, but I think that what he thinks is um, that in some sense, the, the father is Asse and the divine nature is Asse. Cause that's all sort of part of this one sort of package, right? Here's the father. He's Asse. Um, his essence and his hypostatic property, whatever, like is also, it's all Asse cause it's just the father, right? Then the father kind of communicates the, that divine nature to the son. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the son has this nature that is right. uh, Asse. Yeah, that's uh, why there's debate that, about it because the, the Calvinists will yeah. say that, yeah, that well, he didn't actually deny it, but that it was actually a city was communicated to him. But I don't yeah. know how that makes actually makes well, any he, sense. But he will say that, like, uh, yeah, well, I mean, so whether it makes sense or not is another. That's the whole. <laughs> uh, but but um, but yeah, I mean, any, anyway, point being, he does make this distinction between you know essential aseity and hypostatic aseity. And right. he does say that the yeah the son and the spirit don't have hypostatic aseity. So if you just kind of, I mean, however you want to make sense out of that, if you just wrap it up into sort of like absolutely ase, yeah, in every sense versus not totally absolutely ase, then I think Calvin is going to say the son and the spirit are not. Totally, absolutely. That's true. Yeah, no, I, I I did delve into this a while back. I don't really have that much of an interest in it, but I did. I yeah. got to the point where I realized there's you know dispute over, you know, yeah, it's I, not an extreme form of it like I, you're saying. I have a uh, Sam Waldron is a um, Baptist pastor and author and theologian who, for who knows what reason, lives in the same town in Kentucky that I do. So I I've sat down with him a few times and talked about this, and he. He convinced me to go like look at Calvin and see he because he's because Sam is big on the monarchy of the father too and doesn't like all of this egalitarian nonsense that evangelicals have come yeah. up with. Um, and he, yeah, and he's a big Calvinist, and so he's he was like like no, that's not. Well, and, what, I, and I I think I think he's probably right about that. Yeah, uh, we have a friend. Um, that I've known for many years that uh, he was Calvinist back when I was Calvinist. And uh, I put, he's got a couple uh, articles that he wrote that are pretty good. He's Orthodox now, uh, Robin Phillips. Mm -hmm. And he wrote some uh, pretty lengthy, well done essays about uh, whether, whether Calvin was a nominalist or not. So I'm putting some of those in the chat for those that are interested. Oh. I think that the strongest nice. argument would be in regard to like the, the theological voluntarism, which is pretty much bound up with, um, nominalism and right. and that would be right. this, probably one of the stronger signs that he was was influenced by nominalism. But a lot of these Puritans were also very Neoplatonic, and so they would they thought that that like you could that the pre, pre, predestination could also be argued from from this sort of um, ideas in the wow. divine mind being necessary. Yeah. So um, I don't know that Calvin makes the argument, but some of the later Puritans do. But anyway, yeah. um, back to your yeah. stuff. I don't mean to get way off board but so yeah, when, when you were saying nominalism uh, influencing this um this idea of basically because natures are just particular natures there's no universals do you think that right. or were you saying that that's like more of an enlightenment era when that was getting more popular is that what you meant well um yeah i mean all the um like pretty much all all the big names in early modern philosophy are nominalist in some sense, right? Um, a lot, a lot of them believe in what they would call modes or accidents, but they, I mean, they're kind of like, they might believe in, so they might believe in properties in some sense, but they're like particular properties. But in terms well, of Trinitarian today, theology, you, you were saying that you think a lot of yeah. Trinitarians are just sort of default influenced by nominalism. And, and yeah. Yeah. I, think, I mean, like, so nominalism, I think, um, I, I mean, you know, it gets off the ground, like in the context of late scholastic Catholic, you know, like William of Ockham, right? Gabriel Bile, Ockham, yeah. Um, but yeah, like then you get people like, I mean, so like uh, Luther was a big Ockhamist um, and a lot of Protestant theology just ends up being kind of influenced by nominalism. And then all these early modern philosophers like Bacon and Descartes and yeah. Hume and 
they're all nominalists, right? So I, I think it seems like there's a big rise in that in that time period um, in in nominalism, and this big like scholastic philosophy and theology. That's for thrown out the window. Yep. Yeah, who cares? Um, and yeah, I think it's very one of the things. What I what I talk about. This is one thing we haven't mentioned yet in the paper. So the sense in which there's one God in the sense of God meaning thing with the divine nature. Um, that's something I only kind of really figured out after I wrote my dissertation and, and I haven't really written anything about it yet um, much, but I kind of mentioned in here is just um, in, in antiquity all the way through Occam and up into the modern period, um, the, the way most people, I mean, the way like Aristotle through Occam pretty much everyone talks about quantity is they think of it in terms of um, uh, dividing an aggregate of things into discrete parts. And then the number of an aggregate is the number of parts that it's divided or divisible into. So if I've got like 10 horses in the field, um, the way they think about that is, well, you've got this aggregate, you've got this clump of horses here and you can you know it's divided they're separated out into 10 discrete objects each one of which is a horse so the horse is number 10 they are 10. Um, and that's different from how people think about quantity or number today um, uh, for people in the stream i know this but gottlob frege was a mathematician uh, in the late 1800s early 1900s who um he was a mathematician but in, influenced philosophy uh, and and logic uh, in a big way um so he just sort of redid logic from the ground up like scrapped aristotle and kind of redid things and his big interest was in number and he goes through all these different concepts all these different definitions of like what a number is and he argues against all of them. Uh, and most people were very persuaded by all of his arguments. Um, uh, and his his ultimate conclusion is that a number is a basically, to put it in uh, his terms, it's a second level concept. But it's basically like, uh, think of it as a property of a property. So he thinks that, that uh, if you say there are 10 horses in the field, what you really mean is, there's this property of being a horse in the field. Um, and that property applies to these 10 different things. And so that property has the property of, um, you know, being, of having, it's circular to put it this way, but having 10 things that applies to right? And, but, but the way that he, he thinks of that is that you have, um, you have like these logical subjects sort of, that uh, are not identical so you've got you know this horse a is not identical horse number one is not identical to horse number two or three or four or five or whatever and they're all not identical right so he's thinking of it as is like and he doesn't even really think of it in terms of aggregates he just thinks of it as in terms of properties but he's thinking of like the the how many horses are not identical to other horses, right? So it's it's all about non-identity. Whereas in the ancient and medieval way of thinking of things, it's it's not just that they're not identical, it's that they are discrete. So meaning they actually are either physically separated or could be physically separated or could be like they and they, they wouldn't have any kind of like overlap. Um and so, you, it, you know, to, to, some, to some extent, like concretely, that might not make much difference, but there is a, there are cases. So when, when we're talking about cases of overlap, it does make a difference. So just as, as an example, um, oh, like one criticism that people have made of this kind of more contemporary way of thinking about counting is like, suppose you have, um, suppose you have a gallon and a half of water in a container, like in a tub or something you know so take what's in the lower two-thirds of the container right two-thirds of a gallon and a half is a gallon of water so take the lower two-thirds label that a that's a gallon of water take the upper two-thirds of the container 
label that V. That's a gallon of water. I've got two gallons of water out of one and a half gallons, <laughs> right? Like that doesn't like that's that seems like a strange result. But that's I mean, literally, if you take it in a very straightforward way, like the way that that he talks about counting, you'd have to say, well, A is a gallon, B is a gallon, A is not equal to B. That's two gallons, right? Whereas the the ancient and medieval way of thinking about it in terms of discrete parts, they'd say, well, there's not any way that you can pull A and B apart and have a gallon over here and a gallon over there, right? There's no way to separate them into a gallon and a gallon. You can separate it into A over here and then there, you only get half of B. So you've got the half gallon over here because you're taking out the overlap and putting it over here. You could separate it the other way, but... E Either way, you just you get one and a half, right? There's no there's no way to divide or separate into into discrete parts. So whenever you have cases of like overlap, you you get a you get a different result here between non-identity versus division or separability, right? And what I say in the in the um, uh, the way this plays out with the divine nature and kind of with the inseparable operations too, but let's take the divine nature. Um, if um, so, one way to think about it is like the um, if you think about properties as kind of like you you know in things like an in ray view of properties as they as they would say, um, can you divide these properties up, right? So you, in other words, one way to think about like you know how many um, how many horses are there is like how many instances of horseness can we separate out, right? Um, and the question is kind of well, what just what is hoarseness or what is the, you know, the what is that collection? Um, what I point out is like, well, if, if you're a nominalist, if you think all, all we really have, if you're if an austere nominalist is just the particular horses. Right. Right. So there's not going to be any difference. Right. There's, there's never. Um, I mean, there's going to be 10 horses no matter how we divvy things up. Right. Um, if you think that the instances of hoarseness, like the tropes or the modes, if you want to call them that, um, the particular instances of, of hoarseness, um, if you think that those are individuated by the particulars, the particular horses, then, okay, you've got these 10 separate horses, you're going to have 10 separate instances of hoarseness, right? But if you think that those in particular instances, those property instances are not individuated by their bearers, but they're individuated spatio-temporally, mm -hmm. right? Then you might have things that could overlap. They might be non-identical, right? But they could overlap and share right. property. Yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So in and other words, kind of like this one in the many, <laughs> right? Yeah, it wouldn't, yeah, it wouldn't just be one right, anymore, right? It would be potentially you could have subjects that are logically yes. distinct, but they overlap on some property. And on that way, of coming, they would count as just one whatever, right? So in the same way that like, you know, the, the and th think about it this way, like it, start, start with two gallons, discrete gallons of water. Okay, no problem. They're discrete. They're not identical. They're two gallons of water have them overlap on just like one drop of water. Well, now they're not two gallons of water. It's, it's a gallon. It's a drop less than two gallons, right? Cause you don't double count the overlap. Go down to a gallon and a half. You could have, you know, a gallon here and a gallon here that overlap, right? Now you'd say it's a, ha they overlap on half a gallon. So it's half a gallon less than two. One and a half, right. Go all the way down to just like a gallon plus a drop right? Take the gallon over here minus the drop over here, the gallon over here minus the drop over there. You wouldn't call those two gallons of water. You'd say it's just a gallon and a drop because they overlap on everything but a drop. It stands to reason that, I mean, if that's the way we count, right? If you could have total overlap, then they would count as one, right? And of course, I mean, we, we'd say, well, that's, you know, gallons of water are individuated by their location partly so you couldn't have overlapping gallons of water but suppose with the persons of the trinity you you have total overlap because they're not material beings and they're everywhere present and so on right there's not um 
point being is, and or also if you just think, well, these are not spatio-temporal entities, right? So there's not anything to like pull apart their instance of divinity, instance of the divine nature, right? Um, so anyway, I kind of go, I go through that and I just point out like if you're an austere nominalist or you have this a certain view about how properties work, right. then you are just going to get three gods. And then we are, we see this in church history with John Philoponus. He does this yeah, move no, yeah, exactly. where he basically identifies yeah. natures yeah. as just particulars. And then when he goes to the Trinity, he says, well, if we have three persons, those are just three particular natures. And so we have yeah. a sort of a proto tritheism there. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. That's why he was condemned as a tritheist. Um, because, yeah, because he had a particular view about universals, which is that they're just sort of collections of particulars, and that's, yes. that's it, right? And I, and I do think, I mean, on that view, yeah, I mean, you, you've got three gods. Um, and that, I mean, that's how people thought about counting. And one, one of the things I point out in the paper, in the, the essay, I should say, um, is that... Um, despite whatever differences you might find between different church fathers about various points of metaphysics or theology, or whatever, <clears throat> all of them say the divine nature is undivided. And that's, that's the point of saying that is that it's this view about counting that it's, you know, we say in the, in the liturgy, like the father, son, and Holy spirit, one in essence, the Trinity, one in essence and undivided, undivided yeah. um, which is important. Um, and actually, all of the the Meophysites, um, uh, their 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 view about universals kind of ends up they'll they end up saying like the divine nature is divided. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, I mean, if you basically reduce a person to an instance of nature, you would be led to that, and their yeah. Christology leads yeah, to that. Yeah, you just get a one to one. Right. Yeah, and and even I mean, like Aquinas, everybody. I mean, any anyone who's sort of vaguely orthodox like they all say that divine nature is undivided and actually i was i mentioned this you i mentioned this to you earlier but um i've been kind of reading a little bit more in aquinas about some of these things and i mean he's very clear in some uh some writings where he i mean he just says yeah the reason that uh three men are three men is because the humanity is divided among them right. um, but the divinity is not divided among the persons of the trinity um so anyway, I yeah, I talk about that and how kind of some stuff about quantity in, in antiquity there. Um, I forget how we got onto that subject, but that kind of covers everything, the last little detail of what, what goes on in the paper. So, the, I mean, the result then is like whether you're using God in the sense of monarchia or the divine nature or the divine energies, you get one God on any of those, uh, any of those interpretations. There's actually a passage I point to in, in Gregory Nazianzen where I think that's what he's saying. Um, uh, people have interpreted him differently, but he says, you know, whether we look to the the uh, monarchia, the archi, or the divine nature, or the, I forget how he puts it, but anyway, he kind of lists these things. Out. And some people have wanted to interpret him as saying, like, these are all kind of the same thing. But I think he's really saying these are three different senses in which we can ask whether there's one god and there ends up being one god in all three of these senses and a, and a lot of these unitarian arguments kind of tied to the nominalism that you're saying relate to a mm -hmm. certain way of counting post frega which is strictly by this yeah. kind of nominalist identity counting and you're saying that they didn't really strictly count that way in the ancient medieval world even in aquinas he's not counting that way yeah oh yeah for sure aquinas doesn't yeah he he's an aristotelian um Ever, as far, I mean, even I, I've, I've looked through since I kind of, since this sort of clicked for me, I, I mean, I've looked from, yeah, I mean, for, from Aristotle up through Occam, and it's just pretty consistently, like everyone kind of takes this this view. And I, I think what happens is, is just, um, like I said, in the modern period, people all kind of go nominalist. And so even if they're counting in that same way, they can't make sense out of it doctrine of the trinity anymore yeah i see yeah. what you're saying now right so the way and that we then, were, the way that we... with frega you get this yeah. different way of counting so now even if you go back to not yes. being a novelist you get three gods because you just got this different way of counting right um so you, you just have these three discrete individuals right in the trinity counting that way right 
if you're counting by identity, I mean, you just yeah. kind of, yeah, the persons are not identical. So bam, they're, you know, they're three gods. So what yeah. you need, a, you need, you need a way to um, count different things in different ways. And you need a way to say that there's a way in which God is one. But there's also a way in which he's not one or he's, he's, you know, triadic. And the ancient medieval world had ways by which yeah, they did, yeah. you know, they counted that didn't allow for distinction entailing composition or division. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and actually, I think Aquinas does a nice job. I think I, I, I've looked through um, lots of people. I mean, starting as far back as, as the Cappadocians and going through like Theodore Abukura and other people and like up through Aquinas. Um, everybody tries to make this some sort of distinction like this. Um, Aquinas ends up just call, making this distinction between what he calls material division versus formal division, where formal division really is kind of just having different properties, right? Um, so it's not like really separation or something like that. And so um, that's kind of the distinction that he makes to say, that's why we can say there's one God, but there's three persons because God is this, you know, sort of first order term that we would we would look at in terms of separation, right? The the idea of a hypostasis or what they call a suppositum or whatever you want to call it is kind of this like second order logical sort of concept, right? And those you you kind of distinguish by formal division. Because there's things, you know, there's things, there are things that we want to count. Um that wouldn't be aggregates that you can right like separate. logical and, laws or sets that you right. talked about yeah. right yeah or like aristotle the 10 categories categories yeah that, um, like those aren't physical you can't have things. half of a category yeah, yeah. And, and that's one thing that's interesting too is those sorts of things that you do count by identity are the kinds of things that don't you can't, can't divide yeah you know. yeah anyway so it sort of makes sense that we would you know apply different different approaches in different those different contexts but. all right well i've uh kept you for over two hours it's a great chat yeah. um are we are, are you okay to go to the super chats now oh sure, yeah for sure francis bull one dollar 22 cents god bless you jay uh started watching you recently well thank you francis appreciate that glad to have you on board dc woodworking our regular buddy and super chatter since three dollars thank you so much Justice Bjorke, $5. I have a question for Dr. Branson. How does all of the, quote, Christ is our God language in the liturgy fit within your framework of monarchical Trinitarianism? I hope my question yeah. makes sense. I think we already yeah. addressed it, but you can answer that again. Yeah, no, actually, one of the, one of the things I didn't quite get to is it, in the paper, I do talk about this too, um, that there's also an issue of um, that, that we treat a representation of something as though it were the thing that it represents a lot of times. And I talk a little bit about that. And there's an interesting dissertation from, from a, someone in linguistics. Um, the title of the dissertation was I rolled a one and now I'm dead. And um, she goes through all this like linguistic data from Dungeons and Dragons transcripts and stuff. But um, what she points out is like, um, so in that, in that sentence in particular, right? I rolled a one, now I'm dead the first instance of the word I has to refer to me, the human player, right? Cause I'm rolling the dice, but the character isn't rolling dice and then I'm dead. Well, their I has to refer to the character in the game, right? Cause I didn't die. Um, and she goes through all these you know cases where she's looking at, you know, where people just go back and forth freely between um, using indexical pronouns like I sometimes to refer to themselves sometimes to this character they're playing. People will use a person's name, the human person's name to refer to their character and the character's name to refer to the person and back and forth. Um, and I just point out that, you know, that's, that's how we, um, we, we, that's how we just use language. We, we treat the representation as though it were the thing represented. Um, and so if you think of it as Christ as the icon of God, um, which is part of the issue with the theophanies problem um, and, and that theology is that then it, then it makes sense 
why Christ is in the Old Testament referred to as God and Yahweh and so forth um, pretty frequently, right? Um, and why, you know, even in the New Testament, there, like in Hebrews, the first chapter of Hebrews, where it says, you know, um, concerning the Son, it says, uh, O God, thy God hath anointed thee, and Yahweh, you know, in the beginning laid the foundation of the heaven and earth. Um, so it's, ref you know, referring to Christ as God and as Yahweh. And Basil talks about that explicitly. I mean, he says that, you know, we, um, if you have the, the, the emperor and an image of the emperor, he says you would point to the image and say that's the emperor. Um, but he says that doesn't give you two emperors. It just gives you one emperor and the icon of the emperor, which uh, I point out that um, you don't hear that so much from Protestants because that's what that's the theology behind the Seventh Day Ecumenical Council. Right? So you don't uh, you don't get get a whole lot of uh, of that. But that's that's what Basil. That's kind of how he makes sense out of it. So yeah, I mean, I think you can. Um, um, now that you know the Arians, um, Arians tried to take that the fact that we refer to Christ as our God and use it to sort of they sort of did this thing where like, well, Christ is our God and then the Father's like his God. And it's this kind of like, you know, means different, it's kind of different things. But um, but I think the Patrist the Cappadocians view anyway is kind of just to say it's because Christ is the icon of God. So you can point to Christ and say that's God. Um, I mean, kind of the same way I would point to an icon of Christ and say that's Jesus. Like, who's that? That's Jesus. Right. right. Double O Honeybee, ten dollars. Thank you so much. Petty, fifty dollars. Thank you so much, Petty. Appreciate that. Doomer, five dollars. Are the any are the divine energies in any way identical to the divine essence? There is a sense in which essence and energy are identical, and a sense in which they differ, as is clearly shown in the writings of the fathers. Well, they're identical in the sense that the same God is the one acting and he's fully present in every one of his energies, as St. Gregory Palamas says. But if you read the third triad, the whole the whole third triad is dedicated to answering this question. So while I would say that God is fully present in every one of his uh, energies and uh, the energies are really distinct amongst themselves, Palamas calls them in the third triad, section 25, various realities. And that's why the the Tomos and other documents will say that you have to say they're different realities. You can't identify these realities. And so thus the realities are not identical amongst themselves, even though God is fully present in every one of those energies. But also the energies proceed from the nature of God. But Palamas is very explicit that the super essential energy or, or essence of God transcends the energies. So I would say that we can't say that they're, they are identical to the divine essence. Um, and also, I think the Dr. Pino's thesis says the same thing. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much what I see. Well, one thing I'd say to you, it kind of does tie to that issue of like quantity, because the, you know, there's, um, when people in, in medieval times talk about like a distinction, and they talk about like a real distinction or a virtual or conceptual distinction and this sort of thing, I mean, a lot of times what they have in mind is like, are these things that could be separated out? Like two horses are really distinct. Like they're right. The, the gallon and a half of water, those gallons aren't. Yeah. They mean distinction in the sense of, uh, uh, composition and separability. Yeah. yeah. yeah and right. So no, the, the energies are not distinct in the sense of composition god has no parts he's not composite right like it's not like you could pull apart the essence and have it without the energies or vice versa or something like they're in some sense they're kind of a a unity but um but they're not they're not identical in the sense we would use that term like they're just like they're just names for the same thing or something like samuel clemens and mark twain or something. <laughs> right um but I mean, it would also be impossible if you read 150 chapters, I think it's 98 to 103. He actually does a bunch of reductio arguments where he shows that you could not equate divine uh, foreknowledge and divine providence with eternal glory. Yeah. If yeah. you were if you equated eternal glory with uh, divine divine providence, you would have all these absurd 
you know, originist type positions if you equated them. So, uh, Which again, that's the thing that goes all the way back to see Basil responding to you know, to you know, me, it's exactly it's absurd if you identify all these different energies. Yeah, turtle items three dollars. I've never heard this question. Uh, I don't know the answer. Is Adam the damned or Pilot or Nestorius? I would say, in the church's view, Adam was pulled out of uh, per, yeah. uh, uh, Sheol and the harrowing of Hades. Um, but as far as we know, I mean, we're not told the ultimate destiny of people, but the church has, did not, uh, receive a Nestorius. Um, I don't know Pilate's destiny. We're not told those things, but I don't think, I don't think there's any reason to believe Nestorius is saved, uh, which is odd because the Roman Catholics now allow, you can be a Roman Catholic and you can revere Nestorius. So change in doctrine in my view there BM, bmx 1966 15 dollars great video thank you bmx appreciate that constantine five dollars would you say that the filioque led calvin into the argument that the sun is out of theos dr branson don't forget that target doesn't offer gift wrapping in store ah i know who that is um anyway <laughs> um Someone from my from my parish who I uh, go into. I figured that was why, inside. Why uh, he would try to do that? But um, so the question is: what, Did the filioque lead Calvin to say that Christ is auto theos? Yeah. I uh, so I mean I guess I would as I understand that I think the immediate sort of reason that Calvin got led into that was his like his debates with Unitarians at the time and so so a lot of unitarians um uh in that period and on up um to today um what they would do is they would kind of argue like well the um aseity is is part of the divine nature or the divine nature is ase or whatever so what well, we see the muslims arguing today yeah yeah um so that's kind of their anti-trinitarian argument as well that the sun's not ase and doesn't really have the divine nature and so I think what Calvin was doing was kind of trying to respond to them in a way. And I, I, I do sort of view it as, um, I mean, I guess sort of like partly it's, it's a like metaphysically serious thing, but partly sort of a verbal thing. Like he wants to have a way to say that the sun is Asse, or at least like, at least in the sense, like in some sense that would, you know, respond to their arguments or whatever. Um, but I mean, maybe in a more, um, in a more remote sort of sense, um, the, the, like some of the motivation, I guess a big part of the motivation for the filioque in the West was this idea that, um, that the procession of the Holy Spirit is something that happens kind of in virtue of the divine nature. And so if the father and son share the same nature, right. you know, they, they need to both spirit the, the spirit um so i think kind of the way that the west conceptualizes all of that um it, it is kind of tied together um so i mean maybe in some kind of you know general dis- sense like connected, connected generally into that. Yeah. uh thank you for that temple had girl ten dollars dr branson do you think that the roman catholic doctrine of the filioque caused the distortion of energies such that they had to adopt later innovations that led to things like beatific vision. The energies become dimmer because of the subordination of the Holy Spirit in the pro- progress of Roman Catholic theology after, I think she's saying after like Lyons and Florence. Yeah. Um, so one, one thing I should say is I should point out to people, my, my area of expertise is really philosophy. Um, and I kind of, I work on the Cappadocian. So a lot of this sort of later stuff, I should, should just let people know, like, that's not my, my expertise, but I think it, it's an interesting question though, whether, um, the filioque sort of leads to, um, distorted thinking about the divine energies, or if it's distorted thinking about the divine energies that leads to the filioque. Um, so, uh, the, I mean, the reason I, I say that is, is, you know, you, you get this argument that um, the spiration of the Holy Spirit basically is a divine energy. 
Yeah. And and that that's just kind of identical to the divine nature or whatever. And then you, so then it has to be shared with the, the son. And, um, and also a lot of this stuff, you know, like we were talking about before about, you know, energetic processions, like a lot of the things that the Cappadocians and others say that maybe sound like the Holy Spirit proceeds hypostatically from the sun, um, really is about the divine energies and if you kind of collapse that distinction then you just kind of have to say well well, what's going on here is he coming from the father or the son or both or what um so i think it might be the the kind of the collapsing of the essence and energy that yeah that leads to these problems of not being able to figure out what the church fathers were the earlier fathers were saying for those that are, uh, if you're reading, if, if it's hard to get a hold, I think the Papadakis book is out of print, so but some people might have a hard time getting it. You can find it on archive. Can you? Okay. Com or whatever. Yeah. It's- There's another Papadakis book that goes through the same stuff that we're talking about, which is the one that he wrote with Mayendorf. That's good. And when he gets up into the, the sections talking about uh, the eternal manifestation and all of that, um, he, he's got a really good section where he talks about what he calls the triple distinction, right? That by these these uh, Palamite synods, and when Gregory is teaching is accepted in 1285, the idea of the triple distinction is is there. It's, it's solidified, and that's be, meaning the distinction between nature, person, and energy. So that triple distinction, which is already in Book 3 of John Damascus in Chapter 15 of On the Orthodox Faith, nature, person, will, energy, and then he even says the effect of the energy. Is, these are all real distinctions. Those things really guard against any of the confusions that you see in Roman Catholic theology. And keep in mind that a lot of these things you could source in Denzinger. Uh, but Ludwig Ott, if you read Ludwig Ott in the first 30, 40 pages, when he outlines what the dogmas are, I mean, he goes so far as to say the Holy Spirit proceeds from the will uh, of the Father and the Son. Yeah. So, I mean, it gets really convoluted, I think, temple, hat, girl, to make the point that uh, it's Dr. Sherrard in his book, Church Papacy Schism, he basically argues that the filioque doctrine was tied to a kind of ignoring or uh, uh, forgetting of the role of the Holy Spirit in the church, which becomes replaced by the office of the Pope. And so then it becomes a kind of a situation where instead of the imminent life of the Holy Spirit and the the imminent energies of the Spirit in the church. It's like now we're looking to the Oracle of Rome and that is connected to the the, the rise of the beatific vision at the same time because you no longer have the imminent divine experience of God. It's created uh, effects and then you have the experience of God only in the afterlife. And so I I think the things are connected in terms of the developments. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good point to emphasize that um yeah i mean for for orthodoxy it's just you will never see the divine essence (laughs) um but you can see the divine energies even in this life uh and that's what prophecy is like when isaiah saw god sitting on a throne i mean that was christ but he's it's it's the the energies of god right that you that you're you know i mean just a revelation is a divine action, right? It is a divine energy. Um, But yeah, if you collapse that distinction, um, then you just have to say, well, what, I mean, can you, can you see the divine nature? Um, No, I mean, Aquinas Aquinas says you only see the created effects in this life, right? Hence the, the, yeah. Well, even Augustine says, yeah, he says that too. Yeah. That, that's why he has to make all the theophanies just be created, created angels. Right. Yeah, um, and he also, ha- in the City of God, he has a section on beatific vision as well. So, yeah, um, yeah I think there is definitely a connection. And you there. only get the beatific vision in the afterlife. Correct. Which is, I, I just think that's this, I, I can't, I don't know why people don't talk about this more. I just feel like that's the, it's just so problematic as far as our epistemology about theology, like how do you really know anything about God? I talk about that all the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, no, no. I mean, I, yeah. You, but in I debates, mean, I in, talk uh, about it a lot. No, I mean, I mean, just like, I guess I'm thinking about like in academia, like in, oh, in uh, academia, yeah. Faith and philosophy articles or something like this that you, you don't see. I mean, I guess it's because 
people have this theology that doesn't work, so they don't want to talk about it. But but it's just it just seems so like such an obvious. I mean, it's such an obvious problem, like because it's. I mean, it's like oh well, that's okay, just divine revelation. But it's like well, where, where, what's you're getting the divine revelation from Gabriel or something? Like even even Muslims, you know, like have this. I mean, it's it's like you can you can feel the problem, like this whole the whole like night journey thing. That's like not. I think that's not actually in the Quran, right? It's just kind of, I mean, there's some hints about it or yeah. something, but, but, but I think it's just like, you kind of feel this, like, well, if he's, if, if Muhammad's just getting everything from Gabriel, like, how do we know Gabriel knows? Like, how does Gabriel know this? Stuff? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it just moves the problem back a step. And, and, and if, if you think about natural theology too, well, wait a minute. So in natural theology, I'm looking at the created order and I'm deducing, uh, you know, the first cause and the likeness yeah. of the first cause and all this kind of stuff. But what is it exactly that distinguishes supernatural revelation from natural yeah. theology, given the yeah. fact that even supernatural revelation is said to still just be created effects that I'm experiencing? So what's yeah. the, the difference here? I think Palamas calls out Barlaam on that. He says that if you're consistent with that, it would just lead you to atheism because you never get to the thing itself. There's always a created veil yeah. uh, right. you know, of causes yeah. between you and the thing yeah, itself. Exactly. You know, people in, in philosophy, we talk about this, like people talk about the veil of perception. Yeah, it's a veil, yeah. In, in like John Locke. And it just seems like the same sort of thing. It's like you've just, okay, now you've got this veil of perception problem. It's like the noumena, phenomena noumena. How do you ever get to that <laughs> God yeah. in the noumena realm? Exactly. Who's or, so, or like, okay, we can get there, but only in the afterlife. Only in the afterlife. Well, but how do we know we even get there only in the afterlife <laughs> yeah, if if we were told this by created effects in this life? Yeah. yeah. Who sewed the button $1? Jay, would you sit down with uh, Tim for an unlimited six-hour conversation? Well, that would be limited if it's six hours. Did you see Tim's wife bet $5,000 that he would never convert to orthodoxy? <laughs> Um, I don't know if we're trying to work all this out with, uh, we have the Italy pilgrimage. We're doing Orthodox Italy, uh, in November, uh, in my church. So we, I don't know how soon we're going to be able to organize the situation with Tim in Nashville, but, um, I don't know what will, what kind of a setup will, it probably won't be six hours, but we'll see. Uh, we'll see. Pray for Tim, Joseph cash $3. How would you lead to the, uh, respond to the argument that, Real distinction between essence and energy means that there's two gods. I would reply the exact same way that Basil and uh, the Palam uh, and Palamas responds to this by saying that the distinction between father and son is just as real as the distinction between essence and energy. And so, if father and son and spirit don't lead to tritheism, then distinction between essence and energy doesn't lead to uh, ditheism. Any? Do you have any comment on that, Father or <laughs> Father Branson, Doctor Branson? <laughs> Yeah, no, 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 father. I'm so used um, to saying father. To important, so, uh, important distinction. Um, yeah, no, same thing. I, you know, that, it, that also kind of gets into that issue of, of divisibility, right? So if you don't think that the essence and the energies are separable, right, then they're not two in that uh, ancient kind of way of thinking. But also, I've always thought that was a weird idea of these because, like, I don't, I've never understood how. I never really understood how that would give you two gods. Well, the argument is I mean, ar working on the assumption that real distinctions entail composition and division. And again, if you go back to the Cappadocians responding to yeah. Eunomius, they just don't accept that assumption. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly what I mean about the separability and division. You don't, yeah, but but even, the, I mean, I don't, yeah. I, I've never understood how like an essence and an energy give you two gods anyway because they're just different well i think they're thinking of it like it's a lower they think of it like a, it's a lower essence like it's parts yeah and it's like no oh, energies yeah. are the manifestation yeah. of essence they're the actions they're the operations they're the you right. know powers all of these are different terms used by by uh, palamas yeah. and the cappadocians for this constantine three dollars i do not mean to chide you dr branson i'm just teasing you thank you for answering my question no no all right. Um, I've got uh, Dr. Bo's uh, website there linked and you can watch his lectures over there and I'm sure he'll have his uh, book uh, up there for sale and or links or whatever when it when it comes out. Uh, I'll post yeah. the links for it for the four views book that's coming out with uh, William Lane Craig, uh, Dale Tuggy, 
uh, Dr. Branson, and who, who was the other guy? Uh, William Hassner. Okay. Um, anything you want to leave us with? Um, no, I guess I just let let everyone know that that'll. It, we're just now writing all of our final responses and everything, so probably it won't be published till like the beginning of next year or something like that. Um, uh, I think through Whip and Stock, but anyway. So, but um, yeah, no, that's all I have. I I appreciate coming on. It's always fun to talk. So. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I've learned so much from you. Got so many uh, great book recommendations and, and you're, you're really uh, an amazing analytical thinker. And I appreciate that combining that with patristics is, you know, it's just a rare gift. So thank you so much for your, uh, for your wisdom and your knowledge and for, for giving us so many good references and arguments. Um, I want to remind everybody too, that uh, you can head over to chalk.com. That is the show sponsor. You get the best <coughs> supplements over at chalk.com especially the new Chad mode, which is out, which is a great pre-workout. But you can also get all the male vitality stacks, female vitality stacks over at chalk.com. That's C-H-O-Q.com. The link is in the show description. Use the promo code J50, that's J-Y-5-0, to get 50% off all those great products. And everybody have a great night.